right. What's up, everybody? We're live. It is Saturday night. We're Saturday night clubbing, everybody. We clubbing. I'm here with Jay Dyer. He's wearing his uh, his club outfit. We're all dressed up. He's wearing his... <laughs> exactly. Night at the Roxbury. What is love? Going clubbing. We're clubbing. Baby, We're cl- don't hurt me. But this, no is a, this is a special event tonight, guys. We're not just clubbing for... Uh, for health. We're not just clubbing for fitness. We're not just clubbing for the thoughts and the coke. We're clubbing for the environment tonight, guys. We're clubbing with the Club of Rome. 50-year anniversary of the Club of Rome. Happy 51st birth, uh, 51st birthday, Club of Rome. Um, today, we're going to be talking about all sorts of fun stuff like uh, the, the climate crisis, the so-called climate crisis. We're going to dance the night away, talking all about it, and uh, the social engineering behind this movement that we see, this huge push for the consolidation of resources with the excuse of saving the planet. Um, and we're going to talk about a group and a few documents and some other books and a lot of the work that Jay's done on his website and in the subscription portion of his website is highly relevant to this, so I highly suggest you check that out. Uh, we're talking about the club of Rome, and uh, and I'm here with Jay Dyer of jaysanalysis.com. Jay, what's up, dude? What is love? Tristan, don't hurt me. Woo. No more. <laughs> what is love? Ever since you said club clubbing, I've been thinking about not at the Roxbury. Yeah. But uh, no, I'm doing good, dude. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Always enjoy t- chatting with you. That's what everybody's favorites is the Jay and Tristan streams, and. Yeah, this uh, Club of Rome stuff is something we can't forget, and I noticed that you had a good idea to talk about that, especially in relationship with uh, diet and what's going on with where they're trying to take everybody and convince everybody with diet. And I heard your stream the other day where you were talking about trans vegan rights and all that that stuff, the tasting the rainbow, uh, and you hit on a lot of the stuff that we're probably going to be touching on tonight. And it's, it's so much better when it's not just me ranting at a camera and then, you know, seeing my own face. It's nice to have a friend to, to talk about these things with because, hey, first of all, to be honest, it, it gets a little heady. I mean, you start talking about, you start reading these documents and it's, uh, you need a good laugh every once in a while. So I got to bring the comedic relief in here. So I, uh, I bring Jay Dyer because, you know, just looking at his boomer ass hat makes me laugh. So, uh, <laughs> well, I'm the shark now. I'm the shark. Everybody knows that you don't want to debate. That's right. Or else you get thrown in the shark tank. It's like, like I those, didn't start that. Jason Nelson's listener started that. Like but. the pool sharks, like you, you know, those guys that hang around the pool table and they act like they're not so good. Oh, I don't know about this guy. And then you get into a game and they just knock you out. Uh, that's that's Jay Dyer. <laughs> Jay Dyer's the guy a, who, or, or yeah, or I think of like James Bond villains too. Like, did you see that fake news article that Kim Jong Il was throwing people uh, who were his enemies into a a uh, shark tank like a Bond villain with 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 a sharks with, totally, with totally, freaking totally laser beams. Fake story. <laughs> sharks with it was freaking obvious, laser yeah, it beams. It's a totally to a fake story. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> he was showing them throwing them to shark tanks. Well, I mean, th- this is one of the threats that we face globally, isn't it, Jay? Um, we have dictators. We have um, you know being thrown in a shark tank. Yeah, dictators throwing their poor poor plebs in a in a shark tank. But look, the sharks got to eat, man. I mean, these are predators. You got the shark in the tank, and you, you I don't know. It, we just breed if we just breed the sharks to be vegans, we'll be good. That's right. That's right. So we've got the uh, the transhumanist movement ties in right there, and uh, David Pierce, who I didn't even realize this until I was talking to the guys over at Alpha Human solutions podcast and they told me about david pierce and how he is an ethical vegan he helped start the transhumanist movement so um this definitely ties in uh very very uh powerfully with that and so i guess maybe we'll start out by talking about who the club of rome is when people hear oh club of rome they might think this is some sort of you know oh, this is like a secret society or some shit like that no it's this is an open uh think tank this is a uh, kind of a globalist think tank and they wrote a few documents one of them was Limits to growth, and that came out in 1968, right after the yeah. so-called baby boom. Um, which I mean, even just that introduction, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, what do you what do you think about the the nomenclature of baby boom, baby boomers, the the population? Well, the, first thing, yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is the idea that that there was a baby boom, and that's because there had been, you know, the wars. Um, and then what happened was there was a lack of population and there was a baby boom. And believe it or not, this was actually studied 
and they they watch to see where these trends would go. Um, there's there's direct evidence of this. Uh, actually, in Daniel Eslin's Tavistock book, he talks about this that the the social engineers, the social planners, figured on the the fact that there would be a boom around this time period, and they actually wanted a growth based economy. And then what they wanted to do was to restrict things. They wanted to move into this time period where they could test out the ideas of austerity. Now, we are presently going into that period that they literally planned a long time ago. Uh, and these are all recorded in the globalist books, the, the many, many books that I cover in my series. So both uh, the baby boom period was studied and then the plan of bringing in austerity. So what we're going to be talking about tonight deals a lot with this notion of austerity on the part of the bankers, on the part of convincing you for social engineering that you don't need private property, you need to live in a communal, austere way, pushing things like tiny housing, pushing the green stuff. It all is part of the exact same stuff. And it's all, again, been written about publicly in so many white papers and so many books for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. And Club of Rome just happens to be one of the more easily verifiable examples of a of a think tank, uh, a, a planning group, an NGO that that started meeting around this time and put out this idea. All right, it's time now to restrict things. We cannot just have exponential growth, and the best way to do that is to start convincing people of the problem of humanity. The problem of the humanity, humanity itself is the problem. Yeah, and, and those exact words, I mean, we'll actually get to the quotes. Those exact words are actually used at one point. Now, I'm trying to pull up, let's see here. I've got, I will transition over here, swipe, magic of the movies. Um, we've got Aurice, Aurelio Peche. Um, ex excuse me, sir, I probably destroyed your name there, Aurelio Peche. So he was an Ita Italian industrialist and philanthropist, best known as co-founder with Alexander King and first president of the Club of Rome. So this is a group that is founded by industrialists, founded by big money, and um, this is essentially a think tank of high-level industrialists and high-level high economic planners who are looking at longer term than most of us look at right i mean when we when we grow up we're looking at you know we're looking at our three-day plan right it's like we're looking at our uh, our three-month plan or our three-year plan but we've got people here who are talking about planning ahead you know 40 50 60 100 years um down the line and Oricio, or i'm sorry aurelio pirelli as well as alexander king now, Alexander King, he was a British scientist and pioneer of the sustainable development movement, helped found the Club of Rome with this Italian industrialist. So we've got science meets industry right here. Now, um, science and industry obviously moving hand in hand. And as far as science being like this uh, entity, um, this is something a lot of people perceive there being this entity out there called science that just rubber stamps on the truth whenever some question comes into play. Uh, that's not really how it works, guys. I mean, science is a process. It's a process of um, using certain tools and observation to make, um, uh, to create theoretical frameworks for how the world works. Um, the scientific method itself is not an entity, but we are looking at certain aspects of uh, the scientific community colluding with governments with big think tanks and uh, and these NGOs to dictate policy before it's dictated, before it's actually doled out to the masses. These things are thought about, talked about, and written about in books like The First Global Revolution, uh, which is this Club of Rome document that I've got kind of annotated and marked up here that we're going to talk about today. Um, so any, anything else you want to add to that? I think it's so funny that this guy, Aurelio Peche, he mm -hmm. basically was an engineer. He helped to, and it wasn't an engineer, but he was a massive business uh, mover and shaker involved in Fiat, um, the company, and he was an Italian industrialist. And he's talking about stopping the growth of the population. It just it seems kind of counterproductive there, doesn't it? Counterintuitive almost. Yeah, there's a specific document I'm trying to find. Um I know I read it many years ago, and my mind is pretty spot on when I try to recall these things. Yeah. But uh, one of the members of the Club Rome is also directly involved in high-level 
uh, black magic and occult. Um, and I cannot remember where I read that, but uh, which group? And I don't remember which uh, Temple of Set. Ah, interesting. Now that's all my, yeah. Michael Aquino. Mm -hmm. So one of the the prominent Club of Rome members. Um, I'm trying to find where that was, but it was in a footnote. I can even see the footnote in my head, but I cannot remember what book it was in. Anyway, it might not have been his book, but um, the the reason that's relevant is that the perspective of a person who is an atheist who is somebody who may well say a David Rockefeller. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, David Rockefeller is an atheist. I don't know that he had any uh, scientific perspective. Well, his family or, claimed me, his really family claims to be um, uh, well, not evangelical, but uh, Protestant. Right. They were mainline Baptist, but I'm talking about that was Daddy. Uh, that was the the senior Rockefeller, but uh, David Rockefeller Jr. I don't think I mean, there's no evidence that he really had any interest in religion. So I'm saying you could take an atheist and you could take somebody who's into uh, Druidism, like that professor, uh, uh, Dr. Pianca, that uh, Al Jones used to always talk about. You could you could mention somebody like um, um, anybody from these new age groups or anybody from a lot of these occult groups. They're usually united on this perspective that, that we have to control breeding and that only the fittest should survive. So you start to see already that this ties very well with Darwinism. Um, and all of the right-hand path, dark occult groups that have this perspective that we need that that the scientific elite, the priest class, can erect some kind of algorithm by which we can determine in like Gattaca style, yeah. you know, if you've seen the movie Gattaca, no, who film. goes into the future and who doesn't. So what I'm saying is that this is not a, a, an arena where we're just talking about public policy or trying to get people to recycle and throw away their trash yeah. this is about revolutionizing everything in the world and everything in life that's Absolutely. how big that this issue that we're talking about is the main issue it's everything yeah this is it this is the whole so-called conspiracy well and the people that are planning this are the people behind the industrial revolution? I mean, these are the these are the the, the big venture capitalists, the big you know the big banking conglomerates uh, that actually bankrolled and profit off the industrial revolution and off of all the big wars since the industrial revolution. Um, this is this green movement, this talk about sustainability. This is the language that is being injected into the culture. Uh, in order to manip manipulate the mass, um, you know, mind state about what we're doing with uh, with our lives, and this uh, these ideas are being used by these um, by these same people who created the industrial revolution. So, the, the, why why would the people who created the industrial revolution be talking about stopping the spread of industry? On the surface, they say this is about stopping the spread of you know the uh, the exploitation of the planet, stopping the spread. I mean, it it sounds really nice, right? <laughs> Especially if you're mm -hmm. you're a millennial, you're raised in the suburbs, maybe kind of not really sure where your food comes from. These people start talking about sustainable development, the sustainable production of resources. Um, why? I mean, wouldn't they be shooting themselves in the foot? Oh, now it just came to me. I'm sorry. It mm -hmm. was uh, I think uh, it was something related to Marie Strong. Now, ah, we, yeah, um, yeah. We talked about Marie Strong here before. So, yeah, Marie Strong has a close bud who was an occultist who was in the Club of Rome. That's what it was. Now, I'm not saying Marie Strong himself was, but he was. Well, Marie Strong uh, is behind the whole Maitreya thing. He was really into the uh, certain certain aspects of the New Age kind of Theosophy movement. Yes, he was a point man between um, Rockefeller. He was appointed by Rockefellers between them and the green movement and the new age movement. That was kind of his, his whole functionality was to do that. And but, Maurice strong. He's an uh, industrialist too. He's basically the Rockefeller of Canada. If you don't, if you don't know who Maurice strong is, uh, what was your question again? Can you ask? Well, that all right. What, so I mean, it's and basically I'm playing devil's advocate here because uh, when you read, when you first start looking oh, yeah. into this stuff, uh, of course we don't want to pollute. We don't want to, yeah, why would you want to do we're, this? We don't want to destroy the planet. Obviously, you know, there are issues with pollution, with industrialization, and um, yeah. so why is this a bad thing? I mean, this must be a good thing. These people want to save the world. And, and why, well, would, why not... would these industrialists want to stop the spread of industry suddenly? <laughs> because the world doesn't actually work 
in that way. It doesn't work in the way of, of uh, open uh, competition leading to innovation, leading to a better world and leading to free markets and, and liberty. That, that's not really how the world works. There's a, there's a layer of society where perhaps that goes on or there's periods in time in history, as maybe in, the American, in American history where that kind of stuff happens to a degree. But typically speaking, the as the, the Rockefeller family themselves famously said, competition is a sin. Mm. They don't want competition. They don't want uh, open markets and freedom unless it's useful in some specific geopolitical arena. Like they might want to open up some countries. Um, uh, economy to free markets to industrialize them in order to make them decadent and to depopulate them. Actually, Miles Copeland wrote a whole book on that. It's one of the books I dealt with called Game of Nations, who was a CIA operative. Copeland says that uh, they intentionally industrialized and freed up Egypt so that Egypt would get to the point where it would start limiting its population in 10, 20, 30, 50 year actuaries. So in the same way, the reason that this is not about um, making a better world is that what that actually means is a hyper controlled hyper managed society where everything from womb to tomb is essentially run and managed by technocrats mm -hmm. so it has nothing to do with making things better it has everything to do with making things better for a specific uh super elite strata of society and when i'm not talking about the guy who has a million dollars or 10 million dollars uh, I'm talking about the super rich, the super elite, the top 0.0001%. Mm. And, the, and these are the same really people who are talking about the fourth revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, right? Which is the automation of everything, AI, um, the post-human era is what they call it. Yes. So, of course, you know, they, right. don't, they don't want growth anymore. They want to put limits to growth, which no. was the first – the first publication by Club of Rome was called Limits to Growth. And this was by the big industrialists who just a few decades before were saying, grow, 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 laissez-faire, free yeah, market, competition. that's because competition. they wanted the population to create an – the population is a giant energy battery source from which they could produce – the technological revolution and now the tech is here and ai can they believe run itself they're not going to need the rest of the human batteries mm. yeah and the reason that, uh, and just another thing to throw out there the reason this group is called club of rome is not because it was a bunch of romans it's not there's like this vatican thing or anything it's uh that they met in rome at first at the it was at the Ac academia de Lince in rome is where they first met. So they called it the Club of Rome. But essentially, they're, they're talking about the predicament of mankind, they call it. Um, they want to adopt a global approach to the vast and complex problems of the world in which interdependence between na nations within a single planetary system is constantly growing. So uh, focusing on issues, policies, and, adopt and options in a longer-term perspective than possible for governments which respond to the immediate concerns of an insufficiently informed constituency. Seeking a deeper understanding of the interactions between the tangle of contemporary problems, political, economic, social, cultural, psychological, technological, and environmental, for which the Club of Rome adopted the term the world problematique. So they're essentially... It's kind of a lot of the same language you see in like uh, H.G. Wells, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it goes back that far. That he's obviously one of the the key characters. Um, this is very similar to like the Earth Charter, uh, which is one of the brainchilds of Murray Strong. That was kind of his baby. Yeah. Um, where he said basically the Earth Charter is the UN, the more modernized UN plan. I mean, if you go, you can go back and read Julian Huxley and his philosophy of uh, UNESCO, which I did a talk on a couple weeks ago. That was kind of the, the beginning um, groundwork of UNESCO. And then as we move on, you get in more recent times, the Earth Charter. Uh, and it says uh, basically what Strong says is Earth is our home and we are part of a vast evolving universe. And everybody has a right to uh, animals, fertile soil, pure water and clean air. However, global uh, uh, growth has put us into a crisis every one of the globalism books that you read it always begins with we are in a crisis the crisis the crisis the crisis they always yeah. start the books with the crisis they're all written like from a like a 
cookie cutter. And that, I didn't even use um, that term in the in the in the uh, video because, as you guys know, the algorithms on YouTube they're very strict these days. So I'm pretty sure words like crisis uh, maybe should be avoided if you're trying not to get kicked off of YouTube in the immediate future. <laughs> so I, I avoided okay, that well, word. I'm not, no, I'm not saying you can't use it. I'm just saying in the title, I decided not to put that word because yeah. I didn't know if climate crisis would be uh, would mm-hmm. get flagged. Um, but yeah, dude, that's the talk. It's always the grand crisis. This huge, there's this huge problem, this huge predicament. Oh my goodness, what are we gonna do about it? It's all encompassing. It's everywhere. It permeates the very fabric of your being right now. And you can't do anything alone. We have to all come together, and we have to do this mm-hmm. together. Right. And this is actually a uh, socialist document. Now, I'm not falling into the socialist, uh, capitalist, communist dialectic. But you're not I'm a libertarian, bro. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this document is intended to be the answer to the problems that libertarian free markets are blamed for. So you have this period of the industrialists pushing all the stuff, and then you have this vast army of the the socialist left who tell us that we have to be a part of this global community uh and then that's all blamed on the the so-called capitalists uh but who actually what's ironic is that the same people behind industrial revolution and and the the big industrialists are the people behind marty strong and the earth charter namely david rockefeller and the global elite yeah so it has nothing to do with the left and the right stuff it's very easy to learn and to figure out that all this UN stuff is promoted by the same people who are be, are, are blaming industrialism, industrialization, uh, capitalism. It's the big capitalists that run these socialist movements is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So when you read these documents, it's of course they say a lot of things that sound good. Uh, it wouldn't dupe so many people if it didn't have uh, a gray propaganda aspect to it to where a lot of it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I was just looking at the uh, the introduction there, uh, which is pretty interesting. They, they they talk about some of the problems. They say that the uh, the Gulf War was a warning signal. It should lead to a new vision of international relations. So they list off so all of these. So they'll point out real problems. They'll say, "Hey, look, uh, you know, the the war in Iraq was a scam." Therefore, the only way out of this scam is to have one giant socialist international government that, for example, if you go down to 15, which relates directly to you, uh, the Earth Charter is uh, involves preventing cruelty to animals. Mm-hmm. Now, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't say exactly. No definition. Then it goes on to say uh, international bodies is what it's saying will regulate hunting, fishing, and extreme treatment of animals now that sounds like oh well they want to prevent bambi from being tortured by i don't know who's torturing bambi but uh oh they're going to save cecil and harambe no no no. this is about ultimately telling you that you can't hunt on your own property because you don't have property (laughs) right yeah exactly and you know they're telling you that the cow farts are destroying the planet um Mm -hmm. it's just it's absurd so the, the problems that they list here, it's funny. So they, t- they talk about we are in the early, stati- the early stages of the formation of a new type of world society, which will be as different from today's as, um, as was that ushered in by the Industrial Revolution from the society of the long agrarian period that preceded it. So I mean, we're looking at societal planning at a, at a grand scale decades ahead of time. So these people are saying that there is going to be a major change and here are all the problems that are going to drive those changes. And of course, they talk about information society. Uh, These are creating what is variously called the information society, the post-industrial society, or the service society, in which employment, Mm -hmm. lifestyles, and prospects, material and otherwise, will be very different from those of today for every human being. So it's kind of like this hypnotic language almost, right? It's like, ooh, things are changing. The times they are a changing, you know. They they pump this out through media as well. I mean, even the, you know, the the cultural, uh, the popular music, the uh, uh, the films, and they of course everything is well, changing. From the time you're a baby, your body is constantly changing. So they they use this hypnotic language to tell you, oh, change is happening, change is occurring on this grand scale, and you better get ready for it. It's almost like a. Uh, it's a kind of like an initiation, like a ritual initiation of everybody into this well, new world. It is, and in fact, the UN did put out and support many of the New Age uh, initiatory ideas. Uh, in fact, there it, within the um, many of these writers, as I cover in the series, they actually talk about the promotion of a new kind of religion like that. 
And so ultimately that what they determined was a form of earth, earth worship would be the most amenable version of this. It would be the, because that would tie in the both Darwinism uh, and the environmental stuff, right? The earth, or obviously the earth worship stuff would. But could I add real quick, by the way, that uh, in this charter, uh, if you read 11, uh, there's all your SJW stuff, and it talks about the participation of women in all areas of life. Why do you think, do you think they really care about women participating? They want to free them, having, free them from the bonds of slavery. Voice. They're like they want to free them from having, being mommies. That's what that's about. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> by the way, um, it just it just hit me that once I read the statement on hunting and fishing and that being regulated, mm. that you want to you want to eat Cecil and Harambe, don't you? Mm-hmm. And Bambi and Simba. Because, because you're a psychopath, you want to eat Cecil and Harambe. And Bambi and Simba too, yeah. And Wilbur the pig. Remember Wilbur. I don't really eat that much pig. You look. Are you gonna cry? Is that okay? That's that is rape. <laughs> you can't cry if you want to. This we we're open. eating animals is rape. It's ra- no, it's murder, Jay. Milk is rape. This is it's rape. Murder and rape. This is rape. <laughs> it's rape when you take the milk. Yeah, man. I had a friend of mine tell me this uh, down at got a little steam sauna at the uh, at this hosteria down the street, and I go to it in the afternoon, and this guy. He like lost like a hundred pounds. He lost a hundred pounds just drinking beer and eating bread. And uh, so we we're kind of just talking to like, well, what are you gonna do when you you know you get to the place where you have to eat real food and you gotta maintain weight? And he's just like, he's gonna eat bread and drink beer. <laughs> it's just, and it's funny. But then he starts telling me about how uh, you know milk is so bad. They separate the cows from the mothers, and the the dairy industry is so terrible. It's like, dude, what do you? He's this old British guy, um, nice guy, but just. Uh, it's funny. So many people are are completely disconnected. They really believe that you know eating animals, that uh, using animal husbandry, this is terrible. And he starts telling me about the vegan cheese. Oh, they have all kinds of good vegan cheese now. I'm gonna go vegan. I'm just like, dude, you think it's better to get that soy GMO shit that's imported from all over the world than to just drink milk from your neighbors? And he's like, yeah. Well, they take the baby. They take. They separate the calves from the mothers. It's just <laughs> so ridiculous. Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't even realize well, that the original was at the '92 charter. Talk about that, or was that the recent one, the Rio? Um, and uh, the one I'm looking at is this from UNESCO. I don't, it doesn't have a date on it. Okay, I don't know which one it is. Yeah, this is but, the, the whole thing about animal exploitation. That's pretty crazy. I mean, they're they're really pushing well, that. That's now. actually about regulating all that stuff. That's about regulating what you do. Yeah. You see, you just have to translate it out of the globalese and into what it really means. So uh, women being educated, that means not being moms uh, and being in the workforce. Yeah. Um, right. Protecting children, that means uh, trafficking because actually the UN has been caught involved in trafficking yeah. many times. And, uh, you know, re- reproductive health services, that means killing, that means killing, abortion? killing unborn babies. A- a- abortion, as we should say on YouTube. Abro- oh, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah. So, so once you kind of reinterpret these into what they really mean, we realize that, uh, by the way, all the discrimination section, that's all the social justice uh, censorship stuff. It's funny the language that they use in these documents. I mean, it's, it's very alchemical. The new society is emerging from the chrysalis of an often ca- archaic and decadent old societies. Its, evolu- its evolution is complex and uncertain, and its manifestations are difficult to decipher, making the tasks of the decision makers in both public and private sectors more difficult than ever, and inducing a permanent uncertainty in all thinking individuals. So, as I mean, they're saying that this is a fact, but at the same time, there seems to be this undercurrent because these people very well know that that feeling of uncertainty in all thinking individuals is being programmed in via the cultural zeitgeist, via the, you know, the media, via education. Yes. I mean, if you think about the fact that this was planned decades ago, um, we start to see the patterns, right? So one of the things that I highlight is in 29, now going on the 30th book in my series, they all say the same thing on about four or five points. Uh, I know you know those points, so I'm not going to rehash them to you. No, well, the but, audience, man, the audience, they, they might not. Well, uh, so basically in every one of these, these major writers, planners, social engineers, technocrats, bankers, 
for the last hundred years, they all have about five or six kind of basic core dogmas. I should probably put it into like a 10 point, hmm. figure out 10 of the patterns and make it into like a globalism 10 commandments. Well, do do seven, but, do seven for, for all, for all the G's out there. <laughs> well, let's G seven. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, we could probably come up with seven, but uh, the ones that come to mind would be that you have to believe in Darwin. Um, there's no globalism writer I've ever found who doesn't absolutely 100% commit themselves to Darwinism. Mm. Um, you have to believe in a form of global government. So I'm trying to list these. So that's two. Um, that could relate to many different things, uh, many different types of it, but and they do debate these things over the century or over the last century. Yeah. Um, but you have to believe that that's the way to go. Um, you have to believe in uh, one form of uh, a single economy. Mm -hmm. That's what all of them say. Like a solid There's state economy is what they're kind of moving towards, right? Like n zero growth economy, like no more growth. We can't keep growing, growing. Uh, yes. Well, the only, right. So the only period, like we said, there was a period right after World War II where they were pushing uh, production and consumption. But that was before they made the decision to move the Western industrial base to China and to the East. And that was a decision made by our elite. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because China outcompeted us. It's not the free market that put Walmart uh, at the top of the chain having all this, all this Chinese slave good. That was a decision that was made by the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, uh, and the Walton family. Uh, that was all organized by the elite. Yeah. And that's what completely changed the mom-pop business situation in, the, in, in America. That was not done. That was done on purpose. Uh, it was done by the elite. They, they decided to do that. And that when you learn that, that actually shows that the system that we had then wasn't free market. That's nonsense. Those are decisions made by the most powerful people in the world. Um, and they write books about those decisions. And this is one of these so, books. This is one of these books right here. I mean, this is, you know, they, they say that uh, uh, yesterday the nuclear problem was uppermost in people's mind. Again, a problem developed by the global elite as a tool for bringing in the utopian world state. I mean, from the very beginning, H.G. Wells wrote about the atom bomb before it was even a thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so did exactly. Lord Birkenhead wrote about the atom bomb. 1929 said, well, maybe scientists, if none of this works, if we don't get our utopia, perhaps scientists will just destroy all of existence in, you know, in a giant atomic explosion. And that 1929, he was talking about this. So th this is very interesting. So yesterday was the nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear explosion, blah, blah, blah. Later, the population explosion reached the headlines today. Right. Today, the environment is a la mode, and, cert and concern with population has receded. The energy crisis was seldom mentioned publicly earlier, but the events in the Middle East have already made this a new preoccupation. So again, another one of these events, the Middle Eastern wars, the, uh, you know, the oil embargoes, all this uh, buffoonery, tomfoolery going on with the price of oil in the 1970s, talking about that right there. Again, these same industrialists are behind that. And then it just says... Uh, this is, I like this sentence. The need is to consider all these as essential angles of illumination in the kaleidoscope of planetary change. So again, the hypnotic yep. induction, the kaleidoscope imagery. Um, and and these, are, these are people, I mean, they're, they're writing to each other. They aren't writing this for the, you know, the dumbed down masses to read it. They're writing right. this as, right. you know, setting future policy with each other. But it's funny how they're using this hypnotic language as well. And uh, they're kind of, and, and, let, and let me add that, are, are you reading, are you looking at uh, Ghost of the Machine? Uh, no, well, throw that one in there. Tell, tell them about the Ghost of the Machine. We're, I'm talking about the first global revolution right here. From are the you looking at the global revolution? Okay, yeah, yeah, well, that ties in perfectly with what uh, uh, Kessler writes in, uh, first, uh, in Ghost of the Machine because he says the same thing. And I, I was just going to point out that he was a famous Hungarian Marxist, and then he suddenly becomes an order of the British Empire elite. Now, wait a minute. Why would Marxists be working as revolutionaries directly and so friendly with the order of the British Empire elite? Mm. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, but wait, it makes perfect sense because Kessler uh, eventually figured out that, oh, actually, what I believe as a revolutionary Marxist is exactly what the bankers believe. Uh, they actually funded my Marxism movement. So he was kind of elevated into these higher ranks. Uh, and he, if I recall, he and his, I know he did, I think he and his wife 
they were so committed to the death cult that they both committed suicide together. Isn't that sweet? Uh, because they literally believed in the idea that man is a virus. And so they're a little more consistent than most of the global elite because they uh, actually followed through with the suicide pact, whereas most of the global elite uh, just tell everybody else to die. They don't actually think they should die. But um, the last uh, two points on the, the things that all members of this crew believe is the depopulation is absolutely necessary and you have to believe in technocracy slash transhumanism mm -hmm. uh, again all the way going back to uh wells um you know turn of the century like you said birkenhead um so being a member of the top of the pyramid whether you're a blood or a brain or a banker and that's the three types of people we could say at the top the bloods being those who uh, were essentially some form of so-called blue blood um, essentially the royal society type people yes uh the the, the so-called nobility that are inducted into that the brains being the social planner crew people like uh hg wells who was actually from a middle class but he was put into this position uh because he has left cover somebody like bertrand russell even though bertrand russell yeah. is supposedly nobility i was going to bring him um, up too because he's also he you know is openly you know socialist marxist um right yet a member of the british elite uh coming from a very elite family and uh you know tied in with a lot of these think tanks as well right so they wanted to control uh the the, the british elites had two two sides they had a right-wing side and they had a fabian socialist side so both of those that's a false dialectic you're absolutely right um and so you could have the like like hg wells was a was a straight-up marxist but he was part of the same elite and then you could have right wingers in there. Some of the Astors were right wingers, but they were running the Royal Society stuff too. So, uh, and then the la the last point that they all agree on is technocracy. So it doesn't matter w whether it's Birkenhead or H.G. Uh, Wells or whether it's uh, Bertrand Russell or whether it's uh, Aldous Huxley or whether it's pick any of these dudes all the way up through to the Club of Rome people. Read David Rockefeller's memoirs. It's all the same stuff. Read. Uh, Authorized biography of the Rockefellers by Collier and Horowitz, big long book, but it says all the same stuff. Again, the pattern is in every one of these books. None of them differ on these points. They're all exactly the same. And what that shows is that, you know, we look at certain things like the vegan thing. Oh, this is like, there. it kind of goes global because we start saying, hey, why, are, why is the Fortune 100 promoting all the same stuff across the world? Mm -hmm. uh, so we can start to see that meme going around from the fortune 100 and and what i'm trying to illustrate is that it's the same group the same people who have essentially been in control for the last hundred years now that doesn't mean that there weren't other power groups or there aren't power blocks or that they don't fight amongst themselves right of course they're or that there's not or that there's not mafias and cartels that all exists but what i'm saying is that when we look at the top global planners that are putting the system that's coming into full swing right now in the world into place it's been planned for the last at least 100 years and perhaps you could argue even further back into revolutionaries like uh saint simon saint just guys out of france uh at the uh, uh august comte uh, yeah. was uh, an early an early planner in this regard all those guys kind of set the well, stage you all the way back to Obama. francis bacon uh, yeah yeah depending on yeah how far you want to go back but but or, yeah, uh, or so, Pythagoras uh, too, right? I mean, how how far back? Do well, you... if you just mean technocracy or cybernetics, that goes back to the Greeks. Yeah. Hmm. Well said, man. Um, so yeah. Well, those, so those five points—that's the main patterns that you will always see. There's uh, uh, again, um, Brzezinski, Kessler, Miles Copeland, um, Kissinger, Rockefeller, all the trilateral people, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, Quigley. Um, this new guy, the next globalism book I'm doing is uh, Frito, Cap Frito Capricorn, Frito, whatever his name is. Turning point printed so, 75 or something. He, it's an old book. Right? Yeah, he's one of these guys who's like a, a Esalen Institute type of dude. Um, I don't know if he was directly connected. He's that type of a dude. So this book is very much in the vein of uh, Marilyn Ferguson's. We did Marilyn Ferguson's Aquarian Conspiracy. That was one of the globalism books. This is in that same vein, and he's basically saying what Kessler says. Uh, I know we're going to go back to global revolution, but this is relevant because of what you were talking about with the kind of initiatory language. Yeah, yeah. Kessler says um, at the end of Ghost in the Machine, uh, 
that we're all going through this alchemical initiation. He actually says that the whole process, he sees it as alchemical. Yes. Now, why do I say that? Well, if we look at Turning Point and if we look at what uh, was in Brave New World and if we look at what Marilyn Ferguson says in Aquarian Conspiracy, they all posit this idea that what Darwinism did was shake and break away everybody's metaphysical worldview assumptions and most people ever since darwin were moving towards accepting materialism naturalism physicalism yes. reductionistic just bare rank materialism mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but they knew what's interesting what's fascinating is that these writers all say we have known that this would not hold man's attention man has a god-shaped hole in his heart uh, he craves meaning he craves religion he craves metaphysics and so here's the key point what they have planned is the reintroduction of spirituality metaphysics spirit geist right mm -hmm. and this is being pushed back into four and and even characters that you mentioned like tayhard with his neosphere mm -hmm. he anticipated a lot of this because he talked about the omega point the time in which spirit and matter would be conjoined back together. So and then also once you Terrence understand McKenna being kind of a later incarnation of the same idea, he right? is, he's totally involved in this. So, so this, and I'm not just saying like, this is not just a basic bitch new age thing. What I'm saying is that they knew a long time ago that man would, would have his traditional religious worldview broken down through Darwinism. And then they would intentionally bring in through Esalen Institute, through the counterculture and all that stuff the new age which is not just meditating and doing yoga yeah. but actually is intended to eventually be the com the recombining of spirit and technology yeah so they actually think they're going to be able to and i mean and this is where it starts to branch off into transhumanism obviously um but what i'm saying is that it is this shows that it's religious and they are in these characters openly saying yes we're religious yeah. It's it's not this is not a scientific anti-religious thing. So the Dar the, the 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 Neil deGrasse Tysons and the Bill Nyes, these guys are gonna fade away. Yeah. And we're gonna be introduced to the stuff that this guy was talking about. You're gonna have the new consciousness that oh a uh, quantum uh theory has shown us that actually uh the the secret oprah and the secret that's all true yeah well there's a multiverse no, not talking about the there's secret. a multiverse and check it out we found we, we found a, a a way to enter into an alternate universe and we have discovered scientifically that when you're playing video games in virtual reality mm -hmm. you were in another exactly. universe man so they, i mean this uh, people have gotten so dumbed down that they will bite that apple right away they will bite that fruit they will live in virtual reality and they will believe that it's as real as real life um is that well the ultimate destruction of meaning was uh jordan peterson is correct in this part of his discussions when he talks about postmodernism being the ultimate destruction of meaning in the sense that words are disconnected from actual objects in the in the external world and so they do, the external world doesn't have any any uh actual objective metaphysical meaning yeah. it's all projected from our mind therefore we can call anything we want what we want uh, you can just say a thing exists and it doesn't exist. You can just say there's uh, a zillion different uh, ways to identify people's biology, even though that's not true. Every possible universe exists. Every single possible universe exists out there. And every thought you well, have splits you off into another universe, dude. <laughs> Once you've broken people down in this alchemical process, and remember, the breaking down, the, the, cal the, the negredo and calcification stages are part of the alchemical process. Uh -huh. Then you rebuild. Then you put the golem, the machine, the monster back together. Once you've broken down all the parts, you reassemble him. What does every shamanic initiation include? Mm. The shaman goes into the spiritual realm. He's broken down and split apart by the demons, and they put him back together, and then he comes back a new man, a new consciousness. So this process is not just some weird religious thing. They literally read mankind as a whole going through the same initiatory process in their view i'm not saying that's true i don't think that's true uh uh i think christianity is a completely different view of man's overall metaphysical journey that he's going through in history well it's it's but a complete inversion own. this is a complete inversion of what yeah yep. what you and i believe is the real worldview, and right and, and it totally flips it on its head 
And and what I'm saying is that what even though what I'm saying sounds crazy, this is literally what they say. I'm not making this up. This is the way they talk about it. Why does Kessler talk about all this stuff being alchemy? And that's at the end of the book, by the way, where he's talking about uh, uh, experimenting on women's reproductive systems. Exactly what Salk says in his this the supposed hero Salk says the exact same thing in his books. Jealous Let's experiment Salk. on. Uh, women's reproductions, re- reproductive systems through all these different means. Hmm. So, I mean, I mean, the, this is transhumanism being talked about in the 70s, yep. essentially. But it, it goes back even yes. further than that. You and mentioned – further, right. You, you and, uh, and also Melissa mentioned the same, uh, the same book on the le- most recent Boiler Room, mm-hmm. which was a great episode. And you've said this many times as well. Uh, Julian Huxley invented the term transhumanism. Correct. Right. So he's uh, Aldous's brother. Um, they both have the same worldview, the same perspective. Uh, Aldous was more of the uh, writer philosopher guy who's out there doing fiction. He's put, he's promoting things in the counterculture. He's hanging out doing acid with, you know, celebrities and rockers and all this kind of stuff. Perhaps, perhaps, uh, with, right. perhaps with Aleister Crowley too. It's kind of, this isn't proven, but some people have uh, said that it's, Positive that he gave Crowley his first doses of mescaline. Oh, that could be. I don't know exactly who that was, but yeah, I did that, do that. An interview with Dr. Richard Spence, who has a book on uh, on the on the uh, Alistair, uh, Alistair, uh, Secret Agent Six 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 about Crowley's time in MI Five, yeah. and he posits the theory that uh, the early drug research was actually uh, Crowley's what are called his drug diaries. Um, where he he talks about his experiences on different drugs and that that might have actually laid the groundwork for the stuff that people like Huxley later would do. I think that's very plausible. Yeah, there was no um, there was no proof. It's just people said that it was likely. Uh, well, what about Kinsey? Didn't Kinsey is it is it documented that Kinsey got uh, Crowley's diaries? And, and study those? Uh, I know he was hanging out at the Abbey of Telema. I know he was in those circles. I don't recall. I mean, you may be right about that. I don't recall what, what happened with the I, diaries. But Kinsey definitely. I mean, well, what you have is these different goons. They're doing things in these different fields, you see. Hmm. Kinsey's doing the, the sex field research. Aldous is writing the counterculture stuff. Um, Julian is writing the philosophy for UNESCO, yeah. you see. So everybody's kind of got, they've got their little, uh, it's almost like evil apostles and missionaries in these different fields. In the Rockefeller family, you know, it's a good way to, a good book that demonstrates that for anyone in the audience. Uh, if you want to understand kind of how some of this stuff works, this book, The Molecular Vision of Life, Caltech, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Rise of the New Biology, kind of shows how the big foundation money and these big industrialists funded and brought in this massive system of industrialization that included tying in the education system, the sciences, the so-called social sciences, which are completely unscientific, and, um, and creating this, essentially the system we see today. So yeah, check yeah, it. I still need to get that book. I'm glad you reminded me. I'll send you, um, I mean, if okay. it's probably a, it's kind of expensive to buy, but you can print it out as a PDF. That's kind of what I did. I can send you the PDF. Okay. Hey, we got a super cool. chat. Yeah. G, G dub says, um, uh, I'll just do the super chat as Lord Birkenhead. G Dub says, Not you, January 2019. Eating meat has dire consequences for the planet. To feed a growing global population and curtail climate change, scientists say we need to radically change our food systems. Hashtag woke. Well, thank you, G Dub. Uh, Lord Birkenhead approves of National Geographic saying eating meat is bad and we've got to eat soylent slop uh, given to us by. Tyson Foods and Nestle vending machines in every rural part of the planet because we need to save the world. I agree. Um, Do you have the section in um, um, uh, First Global Revolution there where it talks about uh, what the problem is? That's one of the most telling quotes. Yeah, well, that's the end of the chapter called The Vacuum. And this is the chapter that I really wanted to focus on on this stream. Um, and it starts out talking about order in society and how it's determined. So he says, order in society is determined by the cohesion of its members. Until the middle of our century, this was normally ensured by a natural patriotism and a sense of belonging to the community and reinforced by moral discipline exerted by religion and by respect for the state and its leaders, however remote they might be from the people. Generalized religious faith 
has now evaporated in many countries. Respect for the political process has also faded, leaving behind indifference, if not hostility. This is partly due to the influence of the media and partly to the inac inadequacy of political parties in facing real problems, which I'll add, how do we know what the real problems are? Well, apparently those are the problems that the media tells us about. So it's talking about this feedback loop that these big industrialists are creating. Um, and it mm -hmm. talks about the vacuum being uh, leaving open this it's a massive power vacuum. So he says, thus, a vacuum has been created in which both the order and objectives in society are being eroded, which it seems like this vacuum, correct me if I'm wrong here, pretty much seems like this vacuum was engineered as well and planned for. Yes. Uh, the quote. I was thinking of yeah. Did you are you aware of the quote on seventy five? Yeah, yeah. I'm on page sixty nine right now because this leads into it. So essentially, they they talk okay. a lot about um, the breakdown of society. They even talk about the the end of the war. They talk about war being a great mobilizer. There's just there's a few right. of these. There's a quote here, and I want to read this one to you, Jay, and get your reaction to this because I think you're gonna you'll really uh, enjoy this. So page sixty nine here, um, which I've got it pulled up. You guys are, can actually read along with us. Page sixty nine. Um, Let's see. We must ask whether these are signs of an individual and collective resignation in the face of the vastness of the task facing humanity and the urgent need for action. Or is it a sign of a lack of imagination and an incapacity to invent new ways and new means which will measure up to the global magnitude of the problems? The task is indeed formidable, but if, if we show no sign of accepting its challenge, it is likely Many may panic, lose faith in their leaders, give in to fear, and offer support to extremists who know how to turn fear to their own advantage with incendiary speeches. So, I mean, these are, it's just so funny. It's so ironic. They're freaking talking about well, it's all It's ironic because that's what they do. <laughs> exactly. So they got to the do it before the, uh, before the lesser plebs uh, start, uh, start filling the vacuum. So it says here, you're going to really like this one. It is a law of nature, capital N on nature that any vacuum will be filled and therefore eliminated unless this is physically prevented nature capitalized as the saying goes abhors a vacuum like the black holes of space which suck in everything that approaches the vacuum of society seems to attract the best and worst at random random <laughs> but we can hope that the semi-chaos which is now taking over will eventually provide the material for a self-organized system with new possibilities. The present system is not yet useless, but human wisdom must be marshaled quickly if we are to survive. Um, there's a lot there. But I mean, it's, they're basically saying, let's just create chaos, and then out of the ashes, we'll build the society that we want. Correct. It's... Uh, uh that cycle perspective that that death is just a natural part of the process all we have to do is harness death and uh, once we do that we can move on to the next stage i mean the page 75 where it says the common enemy of humanity is man as we search for a new en enemy to unite us we came up with the idea that pollution the threat of global warming water shortages famine and the like would fit the bill all of these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is not, and it is only through changed attitudes and behaviors that these can be overcome. The real enemy is humanity itself. That's page seventy-four. Yep, yep. So they they talk about they build up using all this stuff, talking about what the problems are, and so he, he, on page seventy, you'll like this one too, Jay. He's, they talk about how the uh, the ideologies, the political and, and economic theories, which motivated the actions of some and aroused the opposition of others for the greater part of this century, appear to have run their course. Only materialism remains today as a strong, all-pervasive force. So they basically say what you just said earlier. They say materialism is, is everything that we've got now. Materialism is all that remains, and that's the foundation that we're going to build this on. Yep. So then they Did talk you catch, by the way, who, who wrote the uh, brief there, little introduction there? Which one? To uh, to to this, I just I forgot that this was in here. To this book, was it uh, Prince Philip? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he, he calls our, himself our friend who says he wishes that he could come back as a virus to kill all most of humanity. Oh no, 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 Jay. That's just taken out of context, my love. I snopsed it. He did not say that. He was he's trying to save the world, Jay. I snopsed it. 
The videos are on YouTube. He does say it. Yeah, but I snopsed it. It said those videos are not on YouTube, Jay. I, <laughs> <laughs> I snopsed it. It's crazy. I mean, they're, they're talking about right here, we need to create problems. So then they start saying, he says, they say men and women need a common motivation, namely a common adversary against who they can organize themselves and act together. In the vacuum, such motivations seem to have ceased to exist or have yet to be found. So the problem is that there's not enough problems that everybody perceives so that we can create this global society to fight the problems. So they're saying right here that they need a problem. They need a common enemy. Check this out. The need for enemies seems to be a common historical factor. Some states have striven to overcome domestic failure and internal contradictions by blaming external enemies. The ploy of finding a scapegoat is as old as mankind itself. When things become too difficult at home, divert attention and adventure to adventure abroad. Bring the divided nation together to face the outside enemy, either a real one or else one invented for the purpose. New enemies have to be identified. New strategies imagined. New weapons devised. The new enemies are different in their nature and location, but they are no less real. <laughs> the new enemies are going to be pollution, water shortage, famine, malnutrition, illiteracy, and unemployment. So it's basically it's the H.G. Wells problems, right? It's all the problems of the world. Inequality, unemployment. We need to give jobs to everybody. And, it's, and death becomes a problem too and later in the, uh, when transhumanism really took hold. But this is 1992 and they're saying we need new problems. We've got to create the freaking problems. No, so, uh, the, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to turn the page to the next one. Go ahead, man. No, I was just going to say that that's always the uh, modus operandi is to um, – to talk about the problems that that they themselves promoted, um, for example, you'll read you'll read the uh, global elite writers and they'll say, uh, "Look at the genius of of man," and by which they just mean themselves. They'll say, "Man," cre- <laughs> of this they'll, they'll say, "Man," cre- I'm serious. They'll say, "Man created the nuclear bomb and has given us nuclear energy," and then like a chapter later, they'll say. Consider the crisis that uh, mankind has put us in where uh, uh, unfettered con- uh, uh, lack of controls have allowed mankind to develop the weapons that will pre- uh, presumably destroy all mankind. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to limit population. So the thing <laughs> that they took credit for in the next chapter, they'll blame everybody for and say is going to going to be what, what causes everybody dying. I mean, they do this all the time. It's kind of maddening. Uh, you see that with uh, uh, um Russell does that. He says, he says, because humans have developed these implements of war, which they just took credit for, mankind has to die. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very because, it, because it's, we're all going to be destroyed. It's, com- it's completely psychopathic mentality. It's like institutionalized yeah. psychopathy at the higher levels, it seems, with the way that they're writing here, especially. It is. Right? Oh, so, they're total psychopaths. And they're saying, in a situation, um, if such a situation is allowed to continue for too long, it's probable that democracy will be made to seem responsible for the lagging economy, the scarcities and uncertainties. The very concept of democracy yeah. could then be questioned and allow for the seizure of power by extremists of one sort or another. So they know how these power vacuums act. They, they plan out actions on how to take control of these power vacuums how to create them when necessary you see ngos i mean you you talk a lot about the ngo industrial complex military industrial ngo complex mm-hmm. going into these nations and creating these color revolutions then they're, they're talking about this openly What's can you see where he starts at the be- turn, the turning point at the beginning of the last two decades of a century you find ourselves in a state of profound worldwide crisis oh no and then he goes on to talk about the nukes. The nukes are going to... We made nukes. Oh, man. How great is the nuke as far as a social engineering they tool? They all start, yeah. The yeah, nukes is... Capitalizing oh, on man. That. Have you noticed that they're they're really ramping up this uh, nuke propaganda lately, too? The Atlantic put out a piece talking to nuclear veterans that... Uh, I'll send you a link to it, and they're just... Yeah, that was in the Earth Charter. The, the Earth Charter, the very last thing the Earth Charter says is, time to get rid of nukes. You know, time to talk about nukes and freak everyone out about them again. Um, yeah. It, it, well, it's the thing is that nuclear energy is very efficient. It it it, uh, it actually can power. So they have, in other words, part of austerity necessitates demonization of nuclear power. Now, there's probably better alternatives. I'm not saying that people can't. I'm sure they they probably have figured out coal fusion yeah, or something yeah, crazy. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, <clears throat> they're not demonizing. 
nuclear power because they actually care about cleaner quote unquote forms of energy all they care about is the is not allowing humans in general to have access to clean water uh electricity uh, uh, uh real education mm -hmm. self-sufficiency and food yeah that's key they want everybody on a grid where all that stuff is tracked and traced and regulated and rationed uh, and that's why they have to 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 demonize all of the older even if they're efficient even if they work uh electricity whether it's wind water all those forms of electricity have, because ultimately they don't want you having a car even this is all in the news now in the last two years cars yes. have got to go away it's time to get rid of cars yes. because they don't want you going anywhere because they you're viewed as a a battery that's a virus that's no longer needed that takes up carbon on the earth absolutely so yes. carbon Lord taxes when you hear this term carbon Yes, Lord, Lord, Lord Birkenhead approves. He wants all the little plebs to be on carefully rationed coal reserves and they can burn a little yes. bit of coal every year. They'll get the coal put in their stockings and they'll have to pay Bitcoin for it in the future. By uh, Krampus, <laughs> yes, yes. Lord Birkenhead dresses up like Krampus and he'll come around and give you one coal yes. every Christmas uh, while he tries to uh, do who knows what to your children as he's dressed up like some demon yes. Krampus. Lord Birkenhead will come wearing his powdered wig. He will fly in on his saucer-shaped device. <laughs> I'm Krampus. <laughs> he is cold. <laughs> We're the little boys. Yes, yes little plebs. You, you don't need to drive your cars and your vehicles. We need to impose limits to growth. All you fucking plebs. Lord Birkenhead is here to save the world and we will give you exactly what you need but it is it's uh it's interesting when you when you look at like when you look at the progression of ideas in these white papers that these people write it's always the same right it's, it's like, always let's like an archetype yeah it's like this let's weave I mean, this big picture seem real. lord birkenhead is the best man and look at that guy you know he's really good friends with winston churchill he was real good buddies with churchill there's photos of him walking sure around with churchill was. did you have you seen the picture of uh, winston churchill and his uh druid gear no, that sounds interesting. Oh, I'm dead serious. Yeah, well, Churchill was a uh, committed druid. No, but it's just it's just all for play, man. It's like you know, yeah. And what like what? How did, did you hear my Birkenhead a Krampus impersonation? I, I don't want to lose that. Yeah, was it? dude, that was because I had it. I had it muted. Did you hear that or not? It was going. It was going. Okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, all right. So back to the first global um, revolution. Oh, you go, you had something to say? I just wanted you to to see the the picture. Um, well, you could you could just uh, Google it real quick. Uh, Churchill Druid. You'll see his Druid Lodge or whatever it's called, and you'll see the picture of him. Cool. Let's see. Yep. Ah. Okay. Where is that? Where did I put that? So there's another pattern that you recognize, by the way. Churchill the Druid, with his all of his Druid buddies. Churchill is a young boy, uh, an ancient order of druids. Lord Birkenhead and all these clowns, they say everybody needs to die. Uh, and what is uh, Pianca? Well, he's a druid. See a pattern? Oh, Pianca is. Now, is, isn't Pianca, is he American? Yeah, he's the professor at, I think, University of Texas. He's one of these huge advocates of killing everybody. But he, he's like... I think he got famous because he said, "Oh, it needs to be more than like 500 million. We need to like we we need to kill everybody except for like one million or something crazy like that." But if you look at him, if you look him up, you see him in all his like druid gear, and he's calls his he's got a staff he calls Satan, or he's he, the dude's crazy. Check out Birkenhead's outfit, man. Birkenhead looks like he's a little higher level than Churchill was. Huh? Look at that gold. Well, look up over. Bianca Druid. Yeah, let's see Bianca. So, here's here's Birkenhead. Birkenhead with uh, with Churchill. Birkenhead walks oh, in front. Look at that. Birkenhead walks out first. He's like, you walk behind me, bitch. Uh, Here's, uh, by the way, look at Pianca with his Drew. His, oh, he's wow. got like a giant serpent. He's, he's got, got the bent serpent, serpent rod. Him. It's kind of harkening back to uh, the Moses imagery. Wow. Is he alive still? He's not around anymore, is he? As far as I know, he's. I, don't, I mean, it's gotta be like a hundred. This photo looks. Bianca. This photo looks like it's from the eighties or seventies. Let's see. Uh, it's Doctor Eric Pianca. Yeah, so. Professor Eric Pianca, dressed as a druid. I'm trying to find a better picture. No, but I'm saying, I, yeah, he's still alive. He was born in 1939. Okay. 
So he's um, he's almost ninety. No, he's almost. He's 80. eighty. Yeah, he's almost eighty. My millennial math. Interesting. He, he teaches ecology, man. Uh, he's been on with Tucker. Oh yeah. That's funny. So yeah, the, at the end, this chapter, the vacuum in this book, very very interesting. The first global revolution. Um, we were just talking. About, I'm on page like seventy three now. Um, but the the end of this chapter is fascinating. On seventy three, they start talking about, uh, you know, we need global governance in our vocabulary does not imply a global government, but rather the institutions set up for cooperation, coordination, and common action between durable sovereign states. And that seems very uh, very accurate for the way we're seeing the system run right now. All right, like decentralized. <laughs> he didn't use the term, but that's a big term nowadays. Decentralized, decentralized. And doesn't it seem like this... Sustainability. The global economy that these people have planned, though, it is in a certain, to a certain extent decentralized, although at the top level, it's all centralized, right? The ideas are flowing down through these supposedly de decentralized entities where they allow some freedom within the, uh, the movement economically. But um, it's about cooperation well, and coordination. Correct. I mean, something like freedom will be only be allowed for a time period while it's useful, just like um, the same with regulations or deregulation mm -hmm. in terms of economies. From the globalist perspective, um, there those are weapons that you use in different situations in different countries for different reasons. So if you want, so in other words, deregulation might be useful in some cases, like I mentioned with Miles Copeland. And in other cases, regulation might be useful to shut down an industry. So it just depends. There's no, at, the, at that level, we're not talking about um, commitment to ideology. There's no commit. There is no yeah. ideology except the five, six, seven commandments of globalism that I mentioned. That's the mm -hmm. ideology. They say that um, in this book too. Then I think a few pages earlier, they say the global revolution has no central core ideology. But then later on, it says that the only ideological framework that we stand on is materialism. That's all that's left is materialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So they were still in that phase when they wanted to to put people through uh, preparing them for austerity. So now that they're bringing the austerity in, now is the time to flood everybody with new age and entertainment to keep man's mind caught up in imagination and fantasy. So that he, he, he can't figure out what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. That's very key. That's very key. Disneyfying your mind. Yes. <coughs> yeah, Controlling the imagination is something that people overlook. And people don't, th when they think about mind control, everybody, oh, you're talking about like, uh, you know, con mind control assassins. You're talking about Mila Jovovich. Yeah, I think it's all got to be electrodes in your brain or something. It's not like that. No, no, no. Mind control is Disney uh, because it's about figuring out the way to capture the public's imagination. This is something I was thinking about the other day too, and this is this is huge, man. And people's people's imagination and people's visualization process. You don't understand. It's like when you're when you're training an athlete or something, right? Like you're trying to get an athlete to be at the top level. One of the biggest things you're working on with them is mind state and visualization, right? So they have to be able to visualize themselves going out, whether it's you know a fighter uh, or a baseball player. You know, they're visualizing their next at bat. They're visualizing their next fight. They're visualizing their next movement. And the visualization process is super crucial for um, the central nervous system to, to manifest these, you know, these actions that athletes have to do. These people are working at a more subtle level, a more long stream or a long term level as far as uh, manipulating the visualization process of entire cultures by repetitive imagery, repetitive words, sprinkling kind of you know, twilight language throughout media while giving you hyper visual, hyper uh, stimulating imagery that's going to stimulate you emotionally like climate crisis climate refugee, right? Oh, we don't want to be climate refugees. That's the big term now. You're going to see climate refugees everywhere, they keep telling us. Um, and yeah, this, the visualization process, and they get you to visualize constantly doom, gloom, and you know the, a, a complete destruction of humanity. They did this for years with the atom bomb. Like our parents had to get under desks every, you know, every few weeks or so in school. They would do drills where they'd ring a bell, like Pavlovian training, and these people would have to go underneath their desk and they hide under the desk in terror because the bomb might hit. The Ruskies are coming. They did the same thing. We, we had to do it with earthquake drills too. 
Um, right. And it's it's this constant, yeah. you know, it's it's like you not only do you hijack the visual process, but you ingrain certain emotional states into the central nervous system that can just be called upon with like words, right? You can just say words like terrorism or climate change and people will get into a state of trepidation, fear, and basically like, you know, just total, um, uh, a very highly suggestible state. Yes, that's on the basis of all the studies on operant condition and Pavlov behaviorism, all that. Which, by the way, is another way to show that uh, East and West weren't really that divided during the Cold War because all the Soviet studies by the Soviet scientists were uh, adopted by the people in the West and vice versa. Um, Gregory Bateson is important to look at in this regard. He was one of the MK Ultra doctors, and he wrote a lot on um, the mind, cybernetics, and that kind of stuff. I sent you a paper that you would find interesting about cybernetics and social behavior it would tie in very closely with the stuff that aaron and melissa put in minds of men where'd, but, you, where'd you send that but, on skype it's on skype yeah I'll find it later. um but bateson has a um this is somebody else's paper about bateson's views but it's kind of a brief rundown of he wrote a lot of books so anyway point being is that uh, um capturing the imagination is is key uh, and uh, that's overlooked but that's where pop culture comes in so you'll notice once again, the same plant. I mean, how many things in pop culture do you see that don't promote Darwin, uh, globalism, having a single economy, depopulation, and transhumanism? Very few. I mean, most of pop culture magically just happens to promote all the same things. And you guys wonder why you don't get notifications. You guys watching right here, you wonder why you're not going to get notifications for this channel. You wonder why this gets hidden in the algorithm. And if you even put my, you can take certain videos that I've made, put the whole title in quotations, and it still won't show up in the search results of YouTube. Why is that? <laughs> um, but it, it is. It's, it's absolutely crucial for these people to actually... Um, to manipulate the imagination process, the visualization process of everybody. We've got mm -hmm. a super chat here from Yellow Knife. Exactly. Thank you for the super chat, man. Five dollars. He says, I teach in a native hamlet in the sub -Arct in the subarctic. The indigenous people are used as proxy warriors in the fight against climate change for the NWO control. All right. Um, maybe you uh, allow Oh, I think he, so he means he means that they're just poster children for saving the earth. Oh, indigenous peoples and that I mean at the same time, they want all the indigenous people's populations to decrease. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like the same uh, thing. Un as un unless they unless they want to uh, increase the population of a certain group in order to, through demographic warfare, move it to another area. Uh, sometimes they do that because they and they intentionally want that population to grow. But overall, the long term plan is for the entire world's population to decrease. Yeah, drastically, especially middle class. Right. Uh, they, they want a solid state economy. Um, and, and and no growth, zero growth economy. Correct. Yeah, there was even a, a B movie in the seventies that predicted this called ZPG. Have you heard of this? No. ZPG. I've seen. I've yeah, heard it's, of a, it's a, one of those one of those seventies. It's one of those seventies dystopians like uh, Logan's Run and, and Zardoz that predicts a future where um, everything has been. Well, it's not just a technocracy, but zero growth, meaning zero population growth. Yeah. yeah, and that, these are terms that come straight out of the Club of Rome and come out of uh, guys like uh, well, you know, Eco Science. They talk about that. This is another book that people might want to look into. Eco Science by Paul Ehrlich and uh, what's the other guy? Uh, John P. Holtrin, who was the White House science oh, czar. Some people are saying yeah, Ehrlich's shopping. funny because Ehrlich has essays where he was talking about the coming ice age in the uh, early eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and, and there was and, uh, I, I pulled those I pulled those up before he says he says uh, if we don't curb population now by the nineteen nineties we'll basically be a bunch of frozen woolly mammoths. And now we're we'll be melt. like the woolly mammoths frozen in chunks of ice. And now if you don't change your habits, then it's going to be uh, what all the ice caps are going to melt because it's getting too hot. You're going to be you're going to be uh, underwater like all the mario levels this underwater water world that awesome kevin costner movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it'd> be. <laughs> that was a that movie <laughs> was weird Giddy kevin costner movie that movie i actually that I, movie is propaganda by the way oh yeah oh yeah fully i mean it's, it's all propaganda for this it's just mad max on water basically is water world Baltic Bear says five dollars super chat. Thanks, Baltic Bear says. Do these people actually believe this worldview they're pre they're presenting, or are these books simply ways to get dumb intellectuals on their side? What do you think, Jay? 
there's a layer uh, for the dumb intellectuals to buy on buy into it. That's people at the at academia, and then there's an inner core. Actually, Quigley talks about this in Anglo American Establishment. He talks about the outer helpers, which are a few thousand academics. David Rothkopf wrote a book about the managerial class, which is about six thousand people, and then there's an inner core of far less people who actually know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. The bigger the bigger picture. Um. One second, Jay. Let me uh, start to rain outside. I got to ask Jessica something. You're listening to Tristan and Jay. This is a message from our sponsors. Please make sure to spay or neuter your spouse because there are far too many people <laughs> and we need to stop having babies. So please bring your girlfriend or boyfriend to the nearest humane society and we will mutilate their genitals so that they can no longer breathe so we can all have super also, happy life. Also, your lover's butt so they can't toot and destroy the ozone. Hey, this is Elmo. I want to remind boys and girls that if you want, you put pee-pee in poo-poo. And feel good time. Yay. Uh, we got another super chat. G-Dub for $10 says, Forks over knives. What the health? Were slick propaganda against meat? Is the Club of Rome tied to the Committee of 300 or other creepy NWO organizations? Nothing's free in Waterworld. So, yeah, first statement, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Some of the same. Yeah. Well, all right. It so let, let's look. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> um, we talked about the guy who started it. Uh, that was... What was his name? Uh, Aurelio Peche. Aurelio Peche. So later on, he was working with, let's see, where did it go? So Peche persuaded the Australian Chancellor, Bruno Kreisky, to host a meeting on North South problems in February 1974 in Salzburg, Austria. Besides Bruno Kreisky, the following heads of state government were present at Salzburg Leopold Senghor, president of Senegal, Louis uh, Echeverria, I don't know how to Echeverria, president of Mexico, Jupe Den Uyl, prime minister of the Netherlands, Olof Palme, Prime Minister of Sweden, and Pierre Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, as well as representatives and Prime Ministers of Algeria and Ireland. So, yeah, I mean, these are they're think tanks, and they have other think tanks that they meet with, and it kind of, you know, spreads throughout those. So you see, like, a lot of people know about Bilderberg. That's just one of these global think tanks of heads of industry and government that get together and talk about policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The best thing I saw illustrating this, did you, do you remember that graphic that came out um, – and it showed the people that went to Bilderberg, Trilateral, yeah, CFR, Trilateral, Bilderberg, the, that giant infographic. And it and it showed you how this works. That was one of the best illustrations. Of, here it is. Send it to me. I'll pull it up. Yeah, I'll make sure it's the – it needs to be the high-res copy. Yeah, there's so a can, big one because I tried to – I was like, oh, that's a good one. You can throw that up on Instagram. It's yeah. like, no way. That's Here it not... is. I found the high, the high res one. Where'd you send it? And it shows, uh, this is how it works. And by the way, these people are the helper class. They're not at the tip top. These are the, the, the worker bees that don't, most of them don't even have the full picture. Uh, here it is. Where's the chat in this? So yeah, I mean, I think that's a good way of putting it. Most of them don't have the whole picture, but I'd say that there's there's language in a lot of these documents that are going to mean different things to different people, right? So it's kind of when you look at how, not that this is you know like high occultism or anything, but there is an occult aspect to a lot of this stuff, and the people at the higher levels of society understand the subtle machinations of the human mind, and they understand that one sentence might mean something to Jay and might mean something completely different to me, who is just you know astronomically more intelligent and higher uh at, like being uh, in general uh no i'm kidding by the way but you know, they, they write to each other so i mean sentences like this let's see th there's a good sentence in here that i think would really demonstrate where did, it go? did that did that picture come through you should show that image yeah yeah is it oh, on it skype works. you send it on skype or no in here I okay no, no it's cool I, I found it in here okay but if anybody's curious as to how the actual system works, that's that shows you right there. Because the same people that go, oh no, you like the people who are heads of foreign affairs, Financial Times, all this media. This is just showing you media. This isn't even showing you like the heads of industry. This is just one industry, the heads of media, 
Do you have this a, is who controls? Do you have a URL link for it? Because that that was just the uh, all it sent was the location on your drive. It just says like user. Yeah. I've tried two or three times to send it. I don't know if it's gonna let me. Here, let me try it over here. I don't think you can send Skype. a picture. You can send me the picture in Skype. There think. it is in Skype. Cool. There we go. Perfect. So the heads of Disney, ABC, Google. This is all media, right? All the way over to New York Daily News, Foreign Affairs, Bloomberg, Fox, and they are cross-pollinating people at Bilderberg, people in CFR, and people in Trilateral. Yeah. Wait, you see that? dude, you're telling me that Disney and Vice are like not legitimate sources of information? <laughs> that those are biased well, sources? Well, when you look at this, then you see why the there's only one plan. Dude, but Vice turned me on to DMT, dude. Di Vice turned my nine-year-old brother on to DMT and it saved his life, bro. <laughs> uh, that <laughs> It's crazy. Look at that. I got it pulled up here. Yeah. You guys see the Time Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, all have representatives that are meeting in these think tanks. And these are just a few of the think tanks, right? The Council on Foreign Relations, this was an offshoot of um, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, wasn't it? Like, Correct. Like the American yeah. industrial version of that, which was run by the big yeah. industrialists in England and the big banks in England. The roundtable groups. Correct. Yeah. It's the same model. The, um, the and building. then if you look at, but, but, I want, but keep in mind, this is just media. So that's not even talking about big tech. That's not talking about oil and energy industries. Yeah. That's not talking about banking. That's only telling you the structure for media and how it's controlled. It's not talking about food. Yeah. Guess what? All the people that you talk about, the stuff that you talk about, it would be the exact same on the graph yeah. for food and big pharma, right. for big diet and big agra. Yeah, and this is what people don't understand. Big pharma and big food are the same damn thing now. And I think at least Bayer Monsanto merging kind of brings that to the forefront and people understand that. It's a little bit easier. I'd say people that are getting into trying to get their health back are definitely well on their way to, uh, to getting uh, – uh, when well, we talked about this on the border, on the boiler room, this term has been bastardized. But to getting red pilled, which ultimately it probably leads people leads people to getting uh, black pilled, and then inevitably they're going to have to take the god pill, or they're going to have to go back and be miserable in black pill land. Or back to the what the white pill? What is that? What's the normie? Blue pill. Blue pill is normie. I think normies just like snorting Xanax pills. Um. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they are blue. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, so that, that was a really cool question, but check out, check this sentence out, Jay, and you'll probably see, oh wait, where did it go? I keep losing my, the, there it is. Okay. So we look in vain for wisdom. The opposition of the two political ideologies, which have dominated this century, no longer exists, leaving nothing but a crass materialism, nothing within the governmental system and its decision-making process seems capable of opposing or modifying these trends, which raises questions about our common future and indeed about the very survival of the race. So that's kind of funny. I mean, it's the race is really interesting to me like that. That could mean one thing to some people. So some lower level people, you know, a, a normie college student who would read this document and think, yeah, this is a great thing. This is so cool. Uh, I want to get involved in this. They might be thinking they're talking about the human race. Whereas if Lord Birkenhead's son, little junior Birkenhead, um, you know, he might have a completely different vision of what they mean by the race. Well, yeah, the elite don't uh, typically at the top, they don't believe that the rest of the population actually has a soul. Mm -hmm. And I'm being very serious about that. Um, they only think that essentially the highest IQs have really what you could technically be called a soul. And then everybody else is kind of viewed as um, more or less a version of animal. I mean, literally. Yeah. And, and they write about this openly. I mean, Charles Galton Darwin talks about this he says there's going to be the upper class the uh what does he call them the, he doesn't say ubermensch but it's the same idea as nietzsche's ubermensch but there's he calls them the wild men uh -huh, the, we're the wild men i guess yeah. but here's here's what the wild men look like <laughs> they look like some powdered wig wearing pudgy dude with find a picture of birch and russell he looks like an old 
decrepit turtle. Oh man, yeah, Bertrand Russell. He looks he looks like something from he looks like a Muppet, like something from a Jim Henson creation. <laughs> Let's pull up Bertrand Russell. He's my favorite degenerate of the twentieth century. I'm sure there's better ones, but his book was. If you just... look under images, you'll find yeah, like some of the ones where he looks like a decrepit old turtle. Look at that. Here we go. Right there, Bertrand Russell looks really confused. Like he's he's so mad. Show me. All all I see is Birkenhead. Where's he at? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Here's Bertrand Russell. <laughs> what do you think he's thinking about right there? <laughs> um, snatching a fly out of the air with his tongue. Something. He's watching a fly, and the fly is flying right in front of him, and he's about to go. Uh oh, Jay just jumped out. Jay will be back. Did Jay's computer die? Most people would no, rather die me, than think. Let me share an image. I don't know. Oh, I'm trying to share an image. Well, if you send it to me, if you have a URL, send it to me on Skype, and I'll just pull it, pull up what you send me. I just like this one because he looks like a, like a Muppet, like an. Yeah, that's the one I got pulled up right here. Good eye. <laughs> yeah, he looks like the, the yes. one of the old guys. You know the. The old guys that are watching the Muppets in the theater, they're always bitching the critics. <laughs> he looks like one of those. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah he, he looks like he's he's a half asleep also. Look how tiny his head is. <laughs> his little head fits all them brains, and he was supposedly so highly intelligent. So they're the elite, high. dude. Look, see the, see the Skype picture? That's the elite. You got another Skype picture? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Wait, where is there a URL for that? Or did you just send it here? Let's find that. Oh, there's no URL for it. Here you go. What are, their names are Statler and Waldorf. That's actually perfect. Ah, how interesting. I didn't know they had names. Waldorf. Let's see. There you go. That, that it's, that's Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells right there. Look at that. They're like straight out of uh, straight out of London. They're rubbing their butts together. That's what they do. Uh, they're twerking. They just got done practicing twerking. Dope. Dope. So dope, dude. <laughs> that's so dope. Look at Bertrand Russell right here. <laughs> he's got his pipe. He looks like he always looks like he's about to die in every picture. He looks dead. There's something feeble and a little contemptible about a man who cannot face the perils of life without the help of comfortable myths. Almost inevitably, some part of him is aware that they are myths and that he believes them only because they are comforting, but he dare not face this thought. Moreover, since he is aware, however dimly, that his opinions are not rational, he becomes furious when they are disputed. So he's talking, yeah. about, he's talking about atheists, right? Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, uh, rabid, rabidly so, yeah. Yeah. What a, what a great quote. Look, he's even got a Facebook page. Like I told you, all the boomers are on Facebook. Bertrand Russell is creeping on his great-granddaughter here on Facebook. Yep. And he definitely would be, yeah. <laughs> or his great They always They love keeping it in the family. You wonder why, uh, you know, people talk about the uh, elites being inbred. Uh, well, think about uh, that's just trauma-based mind control. Didn't Bertrand Russell have like five wives or something? Like he he got married and divorced many Probably, times. He had a miserable life. A very very miserable dude. Well, but, yeah. When you hate everybody, and you want to kill everybody. You're you're probably not gonna have uh, the high quality of life. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Someone sent a super chat, but then says message retracted. I don't know what that means. That's funny. Did they get kicked out? Did they send a naughty super chat and they got kicked out by YouTube? I hope not. All right. Well, whoever sent that super chat, thanks. I see the message this was retracted. Sent Statler and Waldorf porn. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So back to the other, the first global revolution document. This is, it's just, this is one of the best documents to illustrate the way that the elite think and the way that they go about planning yeah. policy and, and spreading these ideas. And, the the most the vacuum chapter that which you, you mentioned where they talk about the problems it's so interesting the progression right and it's so you mentioned it's like an archetype the way that they they talk about the progression of ideas here it's always the same 
So they say yeah. the world that is emerging, you know, this new emerging world coming out of the chrysalis of the old world, this amalgamation of turning the base metals of lead of the past into gold, uh, this, you know, our chemical process. Uh, there's a need to bring many partners into the process, business and industrial organizations, research institutions, scientists, NGOs, and private organizations so that the widest possible experience and skill is made available. And of course, but there's no, there's no uh, global plot. That that's about every hour of life. Yeah. Even though they say it's about every hour of life, there's not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they, they, they but they openly talk about it. we're gonna we're gonna have every single level of society indoctrinated into this plan, and they they're saying that right here. The dynamic world needs an effective nervous system at the grassroots level, not only to ensure the widest range of inputs, but also to make the identification of every citizen with the common process of governance possible. So everybody's got to get indoctrinated. Everybody has to believe that mm. these are the problems. Good point. Right. And every Good single point. person. And, and the, that's the nervous system, they say. So they look at the plebs on the ground as, you know, basically just like the, the foundation of the super organism, which all, they believe that they're yes. the head of. Correct. I mean, this is the this goes back to Plato. The microcosm is a macrocosm in the Republic. It's structured around society being a man. It's, it's a it's a one organism. Um, and the masses are viewed as kind of like the outer cells on the body that you know the the cells die away and the body regenerates you know every few years i don't know how many however many years supposedly your body cells regenerate yeah quite literally the the the, the elite view the masses is just kind of the body that can be dispensed with like mm. like we're Tristan, like the callus on more, the feet we're the callus on the you're feet nothing of... more than the bunions upon bertrand russell's toes i mean uh, i would Tristan. be honored you are I nothing would be so honored thank you you're nothing but a toenail from joe rogan oh. and that's nothing that's all that you are i'm so thank you so much jay that's the nicest thing someone said to me on social media do you think week. if we smoked joe rogan's toenails we'd get a buzz dude we'd, get, we'd blast off dude we'd get okay. we we would be uh we'd get we'd be like ritually molested by the machine elves if we did that bro <laughs> <laughs> all right so zoomer joe nails joe nails <laughs> Jay, why won't you debate Aaron Raw Matt Dillahunty? Why you you coward, Jay? Zoomer Hub, thanks for the two dollars. That's a joke, right? Why won't you debate Matt Dillahunty? I'd love to see that debate. I've already offered the debate was already offered, and Matt Dilla, Dillahunty said he would do it, and then he never responded back. And um, I I've heard of Aaron Raw one time, uh, but uh, so so if I haven't explicitly messaged every single youtuber with 20 or thirty thousand above followers i'm it's because i'm scared that's why you're a coward i'm scared you're a coward i'm a coward this person's probably joking they would probably want to see you debate it but i doubt okay. that they would debate you i don't think that i don't know who the other guy is no matt dill honey did not reply uh the, somebody was setting the debate up he said he would do it and then when we asked when it was good he never replied didn't so, he did he talk to ask joke. yourself didn't he ha hang out with ask yourself at one point or do like a mock debate or something? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Did you see? But, did you get to see Stefan Molyneux debate? Ask yourself. I've only heard about it. I've not watched it yet. I'm sure it was absurd. Uh, did you watch it? I got ten minutes down, and it was just the same shit. He was trying to make. He was trying to get Stefan Molyneux to engage. Name the trait. Well, yes, but in hypotheticals also. He so he he create try to create this hypothetical where you remove the humanity from a human, it's the normal stupid false hypotheticals and at least, you know, to Molyneux's uh credit, he didn't take the bait and he he didn't let ask yourself get into the ridiculous stupid false completely irrelevant and self-contradictory hypotheticals that he was inventing so it was it, it was some hypothetical about well what if there was a virus and it rendered a lot of humanity to be not human at some how then would you be able to eat them if everyone was retarded <laughs> that's a mischaracterization of my position and i'm gonna wait until you restate it perfectly in the way that i say that's basically what that is, a that, that is a misstatement of my position i'm gonna wait until you restate it as i say yeah <laughs> That is a misstatement of my position. I'm going to wait the, until the you fact, say it. The, the fact, the fact, the fact, the fact. Hold on, hold on. The fact, 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 the fact. That is a that is a misstatement. 
That is a misstatement. That is a misstatement. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so that they're they're talking about the dynamic world needing an effective, an effective nervous system, and of course the grassroots nervous system of this world are just the little dummy ner- the, the little dummy cells that you need to uh, that they need to essentially organize and give purpose to, so that they can be the bunions under the foot of you know this global technocratic uh, order. And then they finish off this chapter, and this is one of the most important parts. And a lot of people have quoted this, and it's funny when people try and debunk this quote, they'll they'll say, "Oh, this is taken out of context. This is just they they've taken this quote out of context." No, you can read this book, and in the book they lead up to this quote with just as much ridiculous, blatant, in-your-face musing about their worldview and about uh, the nonsensical shit that they believe and that they push on the world. It's all there. So the last quote, which Jay read earlier, I'm just going to read this one more time. In sorry, case you... I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to get ahead of you. I'm sorry. Dude, no. That was perfect. Do you want, you want to read it? This is the most important quote no, in the ahead, book. I, I'm, it is. This is something that you, we could read it 10 times and it still wouldn't be enough on this one, man. Uh, the common enemy of humanity is man, is what they, uh, what they say here right before. That's the tagline before the paragraph. They say, in searching for a common enemy, well, how about we do Birkenhead? In searching for a common enemy against who we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. In their totality and their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which must be, con- be confronted by everyone together. But in designating these dangers as the enemy, we fall into the trap, which we have already warned readers about, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. So you fucking plebs are the real problem. And that's what we're really telling you, says Lord Birkenhead. Humanity itself Mm -hmm. is the enemy. You are the enemy. I'm the enemy. Pollution, all this stuff, those are just symptoms of the cause, which is too many people. So what an amazing surprise, right? So it takes them 75 pages to tell you that the enemy is the people, mankind himself. Yes, and again, uh, we want to stress that this is an old idea. Plato talked about Gaia having too many people on her breast and that this would hurt her, so you'd have to control the bottom of the pyramid of Plato's pyramid is the, the masses and they kind of the, the engine of the machine. And then above them is the warrior class who are the uh, guardians, the, which is the female and male soldiers who live and sleep and hump in common. And they have possessions in common mm. children in common. And then at the top is the philosopher King. Who's the, the, the wise uh, uh, elite. Um, but the wise elite has to direct the, guardian class to maintain the population levels of the bottom of the pyramid that's from plato hmm. like plato and like, by the way like, like yeah. the toy huh? that, like the stuff that kids play with right plato the colored cl- place play stuff <laughs> i joking i joking Hey, Jake, Jake Deschardins <laughs> sends two dollars he says thanks for the wisdom guys jay have kids already Dude, what are you trying to do? You're trying to destroy the planet even more, bro? We're over here trying to help your ass and sterilize you and feed you a dysgenics diet and get you to, to get neutered, and you're telling Jay to have kids. What the hell, man? Well, I have, I have uh, you know, a relationship with my chick. Uh, things, you know, we're trying to work things out. Everything's, you know, in the we process going to of work working it out. out. We going to work it out. And, and by working it out, I don't want to get graphic, but you can only imagine what Jay means. Uh-huh. Like sex, well, they have sex. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, when we get married, we, we, we'll. They're gonna make some babies one day. That, I, I hope to see that. Hope to see some little JBs, some little JBs one day. That's that's not like scabies. That's don't worry, guys. It's not a disease. JBs is when Jay has babies. Um, well, it's definitely in, uh, up to God what happens in, the, in that regard. Yeah, and you can have a great life without having babies too. But you know, hey, family is important. Community is really important, and. Uh, you know, so that, that's what we're all about here. You don't have to make babies to make families. So, all right. 
right, let me see. Somebody had a really good comment here. I wanted to read this. Where'd it go? Uh, the orthogonal pill unlocks the ability to ignore metaphysics. The orthogonal pill. Say it again. The orthogonal pill unlocks the ability to ignore metaphysics. Yes, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah, and it allows you to hyper moralize and feel that you have a, a, a an elite status uh, as a vegan crusader yeah. when you actually have no basis for morals at all. Yeah, or any testosterone. Um, so let's move on here. So yeah, I mean that's that's the end of the most important chapter of the first global revolution. I mean it's it's a pretty interesting book. Anybody can find this PDF online. The Club of Rome, the first global revolution. Uh, I mean this ties in a lot with a lot of the work that Jay's done. We've got to thank Jay for having one of the best websites, the best member sections, one of the few websites that I do pay to be a member of uh, because he provides such valuable information and really, really, um, yeah, it's just probably I don't know. I can't say my favorite website because you know, I like my own website. My own website is pretty cool, but one of my favorite websites out there. So, Jay, um, thanks for doing what you're doing, man. And uh, everybody, make sure to subscribe to Jay's analysis. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, I have an essay. If you want to read a little more on, on this, I wrote a few years ago. I, I put some good uh, video clips that explain it called Global Green Luciferian Government. I think I wrote that back in 20. 20- 14 so uh that one's been out there for a while um but it's got a lot of good argumentation i would say it still holds up and then of course uh, you can get first global revolution as a pdf online free um it's very very easily accessible um and then you know it, even though i haven't done a globalism book talk on that it's actually in uh, all the same material that's in that book is in all the other books they're all the same they're all saying the same stuff so I've got this video pulled up here, and I think, let's see, hopefully the audio, if I play this video, the audio should feed through to you. I think you'll be seeing uh, just the intro to this video I'm going to play. It's like the first minute or two, but I think Jay will have a good laugh, and feel free to interrupt at any point and, uh, and point out. I see an old con- boomer doing Tai Chi is what it looks like. Yeah, well, he's about to reach enlightenment right there. He's, uh, he's doing Tai Chi <laughs> in front of them. He's, uh, he's, he's listening to... Uh, what would a boomer doing Tai Chi listen to? What is uh, classic rock? <laughs> yeah. Led, Led, Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. He's listening to Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's check this. It's the Club of Rome limits to growth, achieving the best possible future from the Santa Fe Institute. Um, and uh, let's let's hear about a little bit of this. Make sure the audience can see it. Good evening. I'm Doan Farmer. I'm here? a professor at the Santa Fe Institute, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dennis Meadows. Um, Dennis Meadows is, is a hero in the uh, sustainability and environmental movement. Um, I, I came across his work uh, when I got interested in this issue, and uh, I, I taught a high school uh, extracurricular course for one of the high schools in town. Well, it was really just a group of six students that wanted to learn more about sustainability. And so I got a book of which Dennis Meadows is one of the authors, uh, Limits to Growth 30 Years Later. And we used that book as our course. And I just sent Dennis an email and said, hey, uh, we'd like to get the software behind this, which he kindly sent and the students used. And and it worked out very well. I have to say, reading that book was a, a sobering experience for me because uh, this I first think part's it, a little bit boring. It's but an he, excellent he analysis the of, it really of the problems we face in a very holistic Santa Fe Institute style of thinking where he really tries to take everything into account and understand the interactions and um, and he's gonna say more about it so I won't say more now. Um, Dennis uh, is a he, he was been a professor at several places, MIT, University of New Hampshire. He holds four honorary degrees. He won the Japan. By the way, I'm going to start giving honorary degrees. Um, and I encourage everybody else to give out honorary degrees as well. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to give Jay Dyer an honorary <coughs> degree in, uh, in boomerology. So, I mean, he's Why don't you give me like, like a million honorary degrees? 
I'll give you five of them right now. How about that? So you have just as many honorary degrees as uh, Dennis Meadows now. So Jay's got five honorary degrees. Okay. These are honorary PhDs as well. And one of them is a ZHD, which is actually above PhD. So congratulations, Jay. You have, uh, I'll send you the official certification via email to your honorary degrees. Prize in 2008, which is a, it's a non-trivial prize. It's a half a million dollars. Uh, people like Benoit Mandelbrot, who's lectured here uh, in this, at this very podium. In fact, he almost pushed the podium off the front, I remember. Benoit Mandelbrot has that prize. Um, his book, Limits to Growth, was deemed one of the 10 most influential environmental books in the 20th century, and I think um, really uh, fundamentally changed the whole debate. Whether, whether or not you agree with the conclusions, I think everybody has to agree it, it changed the debate. And I'll read a, a quote uh, from Dennis. Uh, in 1972, it was inconceivable to most people that the physical impact of human, human activity could ever grow large enough to alter basic natural processes of the globe. But now we routinely observe, acknowledge, and discuss the ozone hole, destruction of marine fisheries, climate change, and other global problems, um, which we certainly need to be discussing. Uh, Dennis is an expert on it's, it's where it gets uh, designing Trust games me. as a teaching device. One of his games is called Fish Banks, which we played at the sustainability summer school that I run last year. Um, it was one of the big hits of the school. This game has been endorsed by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, Dennis apparently appealed, appeared on McNeil Lair and demonstrated its playing. I, I, I uh, haven't had time to watch that on YouTube yet. I, I don't know whether it exists. Um, Stratagem, the game that, that we played this year in the summer school, uh, has been endorsed by the World Bank and is used by the World Bank. Um, and let me just mention that we, the summer school, we have a summer school um, that this is in its second year. Uh, we hope we can keep it going if we get the funding. If we would love to keep it going. Money, we, we may not, it going. but I hope we can. Uh, we invite 30 students. These are graduate students, postdocs, junior professors, people from NGOs. Um, we have several people who work for the government. It's highly international. We have everything from anthropologists to physicists, and, um, and we have a remarkable dialogue. Dennis is um, one of the few people we invited back. In fact, we invited him back and put him in a leading role because last year's students were so excited by what he did. I want to end by just um, with a note on the uh, strange way fate brings about changes. Dennis actually started, he was telling me he started his career studying the dynamics of um, commodity production cycles uh, using systems dynamics models and was an expert on pork bellies. In fact, wrote a book by that title on pork bellies. And, um, and then he decided to take a year off and he went from London to Sri Lanka. And he described um, seeing rock drawings of tigers and jungle scenes in the desert in Iran which made him reflect on how much the Earth has changed and how large our probable impact has been. And um, it just happened that the day he got back was the day that um, they were getting ready for some people from Club of Rome to come discuss with them what his group, the group of which he was a part at MIT, might do. And on that note, um, I would like to turn this over to Dennis, who, as I said, is a is a hero, somebody who has been thinking about these problems now for um, almost 40 years and, um, and who has been incredibly influential. Thank you. This, this dude designed video games for the World Bank of <laughs> the video games. Isn't that amazing? Look, you guys can change the world by playing lit-ass video games about sustainability, dog. Go to the Santa Fe Institute. So, I mean, <laughs> pretty interesting, yeah. right? Uh, and it just well, it's uh, it, it's telling, isn't it? Right away, what's what are the, what's this guy do? Propaganda, mm -hmm. making video games. And it, when you hear it, what do you say? What was it called? It was like a fishery video game. So it's basically like, oh, you put the fishing pole. You're bad because you fish, fish, or, oh, or there's humans. one less fish now. <laughs> oh no! As if fish don't reproduce. Um, but it's it, look at that boomer. Look at that boomer gut, dude. It's a nice boomer gut. That's, but look, this is sustainability, man. It's like he's, 
you know, it, it, talking about sustainability and this guy. His diet's not, his diet's not very sustainable. Look at his gut. No, it's sustainable if he was four people. Oh. <laughs> Come on, you don't you don't get it, man. All right, so hey, we he got Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to read some super chats. Go for it. All right, so uh, G-Dub sends 10 bucks. G-Dub, thanks, man. I know you. I see you in here all the time. Very, uh, very on point with a lot of the questions you ask. We really appreciate the uh, the support here. Two children should be limit, says Green Guru. Jonathan Porritt says curbing population growth through contraception and abortion must be at the heart of the policies to fight global warming. Thank you, guys. I agree. You should be a pit bull dad instead of uh, having children. Pit bulls are also they eat meat, so they should you know maybe a chihuahua or something. And and pit bulls are very dangerous. You can actually protect yourself with those. So we want you to feel insecure. We don't want you to have any security. So small dogs, or even better, giga pets or chia pets. Chia pets are re- renewable. Would a pit bull eat a Beyond Burger? Uh, my pit. One of mine would. One of mine's a fatty. <laughs> my other one would. By the way, I had an idea to make a skit about pit bull puppy burgers. And it would be making fun of pit bull moms. There you go. Hey. And the pit bull mom, the pit bull moms. I don't know. I don't know. The pit bull moms are like making pit bull burgers out of pit. Bulls. So they recycling. Okay. I don't know. Never mind. Out of pit bulls, they're making burgers out of pit bulls. Yeah, the it's pit bull. Pu- the puppies are made into. I, I was just trying to think of a way to offend pit bull moms. Yeah, but you know how you offend them. Do you know this. Is, do you know this is a thing? Uh, well, I didn't know that, but I I know that there's pit bull people. I'm kind of a pit bull person. I refuse to get other breeds of dogs. I really no, like no, no. But this is not you because you have family. This is the trend of uh, socialite cosmopolitan women who don't want kids, who are leftists, who buy into the millennial green agenda. Yeah, they're pit bull moms. So we've we know about the dog mom. Yeah. Like I don't want kids. I'm a dog mom. And and you specifically mark your leftism. I'm not joking, by being a pit bull mom. Hell yeah, that sounds really. I don't. Cool. I mean, I don't know why. It, it's weird as hell, it, but it's like almost like a cult thing. Dude, I think it's one weird, of those. Dude. I think one of those people came onto my page because this uh, this chick commented on. I had a picture up just asking other people because I wanted to ask other people in the carnivore uh, kind of niche who use those hashtags. If you see other people getting. Uh, shadow banned on Instagram because our Instagram account was shadow banned, and this woman made a really really crude comment, basically just saying, "Ah, you deserve it. You're just like I'm not even vegan. Sit down." Was <laughs> and then I go to her profile and it says dog mom. Um, I didn't realize that was kind of like a virtue signaling. Yeah, thing. it is a virtue signal thing. And then the pit bull mom is the next tier. Yeah. That's an even higher tier than dog mom. Yeah, I mean, I just I assumed uh-huh. she was some sort of a weirdo because it's like, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, thanks to that lady who left that gloating comment, laughing at me for being shadow banned on Instagram. I, uh, I that will be maybe a green thing of you to uh, to be cheering it on because maybe that would help my children to not be able to eat. So perhaps that would be green because it would stop the uh, the nasty CO two from from growing children. Um, uh, Philo says, great job, guys. Still waiting for Jay to do a deep dive into Cannonball Run 2. I've never seen that. You seen it? i never even heard of it. Uh, I mean, I've seen Cannonball Run. That's famous with, you know, That's just Burt like, Reynolds. But it's just is like there a, a part? Race. I don't even remember. If is there a part two? Cannonball um, Run is just like a goofy race movie, right? Yeah, it is. They yeah. got to get the beer down to. There's beer in Texarkana. I hear it's, it's raining outside, and I left the top down on my car. But Eastbound and down, loaded up and running. That show was pretty funny, Eastbound and Down. The second season of that is basically like... Well, no, but that song by Jerry Reed is about Cannonball Run. Yeah. And but that the, there is a Cannonball Run too, by the way, which yeah. I've never seen. That's cool. The first one is a good movie, though. With the Burt, It's a good Burt Reynolds movie. So Eastbound and Down is a song about Cannon, Cannonball Run. Correct. Wow. The second season of Eastbound and Down, when he goes to Mexico, that is actually yeah, th- th- that's about my life. That's basically how <laughs> that's like exactly how my life is here. Second season, you guys want to know what it's like living in Ecuador? So yeah. you're basically falling, you're coked out of your mind, falling over drunk. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Remember when he falls to the table? <laughs> chicken fights and 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 uh, yep. yeah, dude, that's that's me, man, all day long, cocaine and chicken fights. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> No, cocaine and cock fights. There you go. 
Yo. That's going to be my, I'll make a country song. Cocaine and cockfights. <laughs> Can't stand the late nights. <laughs> Gotta boom a girlfriend who lives in town that my wife don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I don't see any more super chats. Um, so uh, you, uh, that book that you showed me, how, how far into that are you? What's it called again? The one I you... just started. Turning Point, that one? Yeah. It's just kind of like transitioning to the post-human era? I just got it? it in the mail a couple days ago, so I just started it. <laughs> yeah, it's about the transition from uh, Darwinism and materialism into uh, a new way to blend. It's almost probably, it's like theosophy, basically. I mean, I don't know if this guy is a theosophist, but mm. he's like... Uh, when we realize that everything's one, then we realize that science and religion are uh, talk about the same thing, man. And we just need like it's like a Ben Gertzel type of uh, thing. If Ben Gertzel weren't a materialist, like if he were, cool. if he were, if Ben Gertzel actually looked at his worldview and said, "Oh yeah, what is the soul that I'm trying to put into, or what is what well, is this uh, guy's? It's this like, like this is sci- This is how do we blend New Age and scientism? Is what yeah. this is. So it's right. Like, so science, scientism is inadequate. Uh, quantum physics will give us a scientific way to understand uh, the spirit, and he doesn't mean any anything to do with traditional religions. He just means a scientific version of the new age, basically. Mm-hmm. Is what this is. Have you, what about Have you read that book um, by Gibson, the techno? Uh, I read like the first few chapters of it only, but it's uh, like that cyberpunk book. Um, Neuromancer. Yes, Neuromancer. That just that comes to mind for some reason. That whole techno. Think, yeah, he talks about the Matrix in there. It's a crazy book. Well, I mean, it's, oh, it's I basically has, technology and there. magic. It's like that's mm-hmm. a, it's about dark, black magic and tech. Um, there's that Dell the Funky Homo Sapiens song where he's like Neuromancer, perfect blend of technology and magic. He was really into that book, but I I got that book because of Dell <laughs> back in the day, but I never finished it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, wow. Dell the Funky cool. Homo Sapien was trying to get us woke back in the day. He actually he has some. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, some of his lyrics, but he's got some good stuff. There's a few tracks where he's like, "This is one one more recent one. I'll try to find him. I can't quote it, but uh, yeah, he he had read all this stuff too." And he did an album. Somebody else was talking about a, a a woke rapper from the '90s, and I never even noticed it. I was I went back and listened. I forgot who it was. I was talking to. I was like, man, that was pretty. That was pretty Bay's lyrics, and I didn't even catch it at the time. There's a few Wu Tang lyrics from the '90s that were like really, really went far. You know, there's this really? one. Yeah, he's he's. Uh, let me pull up. Uh, I talked about it on on a stream one time, but I don't want to misquote the RZA and offend him. Uh, the RZA, who now does PETA ads and says we're the same as rats. Um, the song Impossible from Wu-Tang Forever. Wu-Tang is for the children, y'all. So in between you know, <laughs> promoting uh, drugs and, and weapons sales, RZA talks about – all right, here he goes. Um, there we go. Stapleton's been stamped as a concentration camp. At night, I walk through third eye bright as a street lamp. Electric microbes, robotic probes, te- taking telescope pictures of the globes. Babies getting pierced with microchips stuck inside their earlobes. Then examinated, blood contaminated, vaccinated, lives fabricated. Exaggeration, authorization, Food and Drug Administration, testing poison on the prison population. <laughs> so, I mean, that there's a lot in there. Um, but now he's selling PETA. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there are there are a few of these rappers from the '90s that had some stuff. Deltron thirty, Deltron three thousand thirty. That album, it's all like about futurism, transhumanism, um, mm. based on basically the Neuromancer book. I think he based a lot of it on that. But it's an interesting album too. Cool beans, dude. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're about we're at about two hours now, maybe a little bit past two hours. Jay and I can babble for days about this stuff, but. uh yeah, man. Are you anything else you want to tie in here? Any other ideas that you think are relevant to bring up? I mean, we. I think I, we hit all the high points. I mean, I, I made notes before this, and uh, actually, I was going to remind people this video kind of got buried in the algorithm. But um, if you want to check out my video, 
uh, on Ghost in the Machine. It's very relevant to what we talked about today. Um, and I did it like back in 2017, but it's called uh, Soy Boy. Soy Boy, a plan to you. Soy Boy, an actual plan to mutate man. Uh, that video is very relevant. And it's, it's about just a 20 minute talk I did on uh, Ghost in the Machine from Kessler. And that's an overlooked globalism book, but it's very important actually. It comes up um, in Dr. Holger Heigen, Dr. Holger Heiden's writings about the 68, 69 CIA mind control conference that they held where they were talking about all these different techniques tying into MK Ultra and cybernetics and all this stuff, which I covered in Esoteric Hollywood 1. So if you want to read about that, you can get my books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, at Jay's Analysis in the shop. Sign copies, don't get it from Amazon. There you go. Yeah, make sure that that's a really Monday. big thing. Oops, is a platform. Sorry, I'm, there's the audio. That Pull it up, that video. I'm going to put that video in the chat so that you guys in the chat right there can see. Uh, check out Thanks, first of all make sure to check out jay's channel and then that video is in the chat so you can uh you can peep that video i mean it, there's a lot of stuff in uh in jay's member section on his website as well so make sure to uh to head over there and subscribe to jay's yeah, that's about that's actually a 350 400 page book and this that 20 minute video just covers the intro if you want the full analysis of that 350 400 page book you have to subscribe right there you go there you go so and also um Let's see. What else? Any other announcements? Well, let, let's let's talk a little bit. We see we see this huge push for uh, sustainable development. This huge uh, push for sustainable sustainability in diet. And one of the really big aspects of this agenda is pulling people off the land and removing your ability to feed yourselves. Removing the knowledge that we have about how to work land, how to actually derive nutrients from the land. Dude, is that? I'm sorry, dude. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That pissed you off? Nothing pisses me. You look off. mad, dude. I just always look mad. I'm, we're talking about the we're we're we're, we're butting <laughs> well, heads I with the to devil. Ask man. You, it reminds me of milk. I bought milk, uh -huh. uh, and it says not for human consumption. That's the good and stuff. That's because the stupid government doesn't want you to consume actual raw milk, and that's the only milk you should consume, right? So it's right. It's crazy. It's crazy. Do you like the raw it milk? It is crazy. Does it taste different to you? Yeah, of course. It tastes so good, right? Yeah, it's really good. I love raw milk. I just I drank a liter when we were talking earlier. I drank three of these, four of these today, I think. Um, it's just funny, though, that in the U.S., when you go and try to buy it in various states where it's illegal, it says not for human consumption, although everybody's buying it to consume it. <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm serious, isn't it? It's that stupid. It's pretty ridiculous, man. And I mean, this is this is a part of it, right? So it, all the real good foods that are truly sustainable, like in, even in the sense that they're putting it uh, out there about, you know, we need to use less resources. We need to uh, we need to make sure things are sustainable. Look, you want renewable energy. You want a renewable food source. Animal husbandry, right? Like you, you can keep cows on a small amount of land, you, even in uh, no matter where you're at. You can have access to animal foods in your own backyard, whether it's chickens, goats, sheep. Some of these animals need very little space, and I don't mean you can find them in like a you know, make a feed lot in your backyard. But it's uh, you know we we can move towards more sustainable um, <laughs> development of our protein and fat sources, and we can get nutrition from our backyard so these people are trying to remove our ability to feed ourselves they're trying to remove the knowledge that our ancestors passed on to us of how to feed ourselves our ancestors your grandma your grandpa knew that lard was good food your grandma and grandpa knew that butter was good your grandma and grandpa knew this stuff and they knew how to feed themselves how to feed their children we've been removed from that and kind of placed in this whole technocratic model of food production and this is very pervasive so one of the ways that we can battle this is through feeding ourselves good food right disconnecting from this corporatocracy of technocratic food junk shit and eating real good stuff so you know raw milk right uh grass-fed beef right these are truly um the sustainable word is so freaking annoying but these are good food sources renewable food sources jay's frozen there that you can have and oh you're not frozen you're reading um <laughs> no, but, I'm responding to this guy who was spamming my chat last night. Now he's spamming your chat, and all he yeah. does is come in and he do, he just posts a bunch of blasphemous stuff, which oh, yeah. like he was making these really lewd, blasphemous jokes in my chat. So, oh, um, man. 
Yeah, that's the guy that sent. Uh, he sent you a super chat saying that you wouldn't debate Dilla Hunty as if Dilla Hunty is some intellectual giant that you're cowering from. <laughs> I thought he was joking. I thought this dude was joking. No, that guy's a slime bag. Zoomer Hub, and he's even he's even using he's even trying to cat call you with his uh, his avatar, the name that he chose. What a what a douche. What a deuce. But yeah, guys, uh, you know, the food supply, it's, it's very bastardized as well. And you're going to see a bigger push this year for, uh, they say, plant-based because it makes it sound nice and sustainable. But it's absolutely untrue that so-called plant-based diets are better for your health or better for society, for culture, and the environment. So, um, you know, we're always trying to uh, nudge people towards getting local foods, getting foods from your local area. You, know, you can go to the farms. You can look at uh, the way your food is produced. You can be a part of it as well. And it's a really good way of getting, uh, getting in touch with cool people, getting in touch with your local environment, and, uh, and just feeling better in general. So let's, uh, let's, there are ways to fight this. And the way to fight this is not necessarily through going out in the streets, screaming and yelling like these people are with their climate alarmism. Uh, the way is through educating ourselves and our families. The way is through not allowing our families and friends and uh, the people around us to get sucked into all this nonsense so we can feed ourselves uh, and learn good practices around nutrition. That's what we're always teaching here. So animal foods are foods. Uh, this plant-based diet is based on products. And ultimately, this turns us into a product. So... Um, yeah, we're, we're all about teaching people how to um, live a healthy, happy life here. And living a healthy life includes more than just what you eat. So that's why it's really important that we have intellectual giants on the channel like Jay Dyer, uh, who runs one of the most important YouTube channels out there, buried by the algorithm. His website, Jay Dyer, or I'm sorry, jaysanalysis.com is highly valuable. So um, you guys, we're going to wrap this up few more uh, announcements right now, though. Uh, we've got the Keto and Carnivore Collective. Our group coaching setup is going to be going down in July again. So July 7th, we're going to start the next round of the Keto and Carnivore Collective. It's a live community coaching. We kind of run it like a course, and you get two live interactive voice chats per week where you can ask us whatever you want. Uh, one of those has a lesson as well attached to it. So we're basically trying to teach you how to do a ketogenic, a low carbohydrate, or uh, animal-based ketogenic diet as well if you're more into the carnivorous approach. A lot of people with autoimmune conditions, with gut dysbiosis issues, with uh, digestive issues. Like A lot of us have just taken a lot of antibiotics. Shit, a lot of us maybe grew up taking Advil for uh, the pain that we had from other chronic ailments that we had. And these ruin our guts. These ruin our liver. A lot of us have difficulty digesting. So an animal-based ketogenic diet where you're eating fat, animal foods, fatty steaks, fatty cuts of meat, fatty animal foods is definitely um, <clears throat> very, very beneficial for a lot of people who have autoimmune conditions, gut issues and whatnot. So we found that a lot of our audience has been gravitating towards a carnivorous diet. So we do the keto collective and we actually had to transition to the keto and carnivore collective because of the popularity of carnivore. So if you want to join this, uh, you can click on the link in the description of the video. Uh, we still do private coaching, but we do a little bit less of the private coaching because this group coaching allows us to take on more clients and you actually get a lot more face time with us. You get a lot more one-on-one -on -one one um, interaction with us and it's a really fun way of doing it so the keto and carnivore collective community coaching is going down july 7th you can sign up for that now uh, the carnivore cookbook is available now at primaledgehealth.com here it is right here beautiful book jessica made uh, she spent a long time on this take back your kitchen take back your health take back your culture carnivore cookbook no animals were harmed I'm sorry no plants were harmed in the making of this carnivore cookbook and uh, you can find that at primaledgehealth.com too um jay let, let, let's wrap it up dude i know you've been kind of messing with diet you mentioned you're drinking a little bit of raw milk um how, how do you how's your gut handle that raw milk a lot of people really enjoy it some people say i don't know about this how do you feel with that uh, well, I got it two days ago, so I've only been trying it for three days. I haven't had any problems so far, um, but I'm on, I think, almost four months of, of pretty pretty strict carnivore. 90, 95% of my diet is is meat, eggs, fish. Yeah. So um, no carbs except for occasional potato chip, hardly ever. I don't do any desserts except a little bit of chocolate here and there. Um, no fruits, maybe a little bit of uh, watermelon here and there. Um, but again, 90, 95% carnivore and it's been nothing but hundred percent positive. So yeah. I can only thank you for, for introducing me to that whole 
Well, I would say Jordan Peterson and Michaela inadvertently introduced me to the idea. I thought it was crazy, but I think over time you really laid out the logic of it and it, and yeah. it made a lot of sense. So it's, it's been great for my gut. So thank you for that. Awesome, man. Well, yeah, I'm glad it's helpful. Glad I could uh, help in any way, dude. So there you go. Jay, Jay Dyer getting some benefits from carnivore. You know, a lot by the of- way, I've lost weight. If you look at pictures of me like a year ago, I look like a f- fat ass slob. <laughs> How much? I've lost about, I don't know, probably 20 pounds. Four months? From a year ago, probably. Dang, dude. Congratulations. Maybe 15. Hmm? You've been doing ballet, though, right? Yes, water aerobics uh, and uh, boomer bouncing uh, uh, Zumba. Jay's a competitive bocce ball player. In, uh, in... I'm a competitive Zumba. Uh, uh, we have a here at my boomer condo. I get out there with all the – I do Zumba with the – boomers all the gills mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go <laughs> dude that's awesome so uh yeah so bocce i don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no that's really cool i went for man. i did yesterday i did go for a walk for like three miles while i was arguing and debating in discord so wow. I, I try to i try to implement debate and doing a three mile walk so, at the same time so you're, in the middle <laughs> of the heat. Pretty crazy. you're doing a three mile walk do. getting your exercise while raising your cortisol levels up from the stress of and <laughs> debating for three hours in discord but yeah it was it was great you definitely look leaner man so, uh, okay says jay looks leaner i was watching old videos and he had carb bloat he's looking fit mm-hmm. um yeah that's awesome that's awesome yeah dude getting rid of carbs man is a a, a big one why are we getting retracted messages? What's happening with these retracted messages? I wish I could read them. I got rid of the the goon, and then he came in with his uh, backup go. account, and I was idiotically saying, "You didn't get me. I have a backup account." So, <laughs> like, dude, if you want to come in with your backup account, don't identify yourself. Bro. Oh man, it just it just goes on and on and on with these people. But it's like, hey, look, ask yourself, Isaac. It's okay, man. Just. Uh, just get over it, dude. Is he in there? Is he in there now? I'm just kidding. I, I was assuming it was him. Oh. There he goes. All right, but uh, now, Zoomer Hub is is some goon, dude. Like, uh, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a millennial boomer, and I don't understand technology. I mean, it's a mo- boomer. That's what it's called, the Moomer. What is who? Who are all these shitheads in your in your chat? And by the way, this is a guy who follows my stuff and tweets me. Maybe he's joking. I can never tell if people are joking. <laughs> this is the nature of the internet, man. This is just yeah. how it goes these days. It's pretty ridiculous. Oh, I had another video pulled up. I mean, we just did a, basically a sign out. This the Club of Rome climate emergency plan. Maybe we'll hit on this on another one. But uh, you guys maybe check this one out later on if you want to. This. They lay out the climate emergency plan, which is basically everything they talked about here, lower population. He talks about in this video, the climate uh, emergency plan. He says he wants to decrease um, carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. And the way that this is going to be accomplished is through taxation of people in the Western world. And then they're going to take a lot of that tax money. He said they want to send $110 billion to developing countries to help them develop meaning to uh, get them uh, addicted to the technological advances advances that they want to, uh, to, propose, uh, to propose for them. And then he talks about having a solid-state economy long-term uh, for the entire world. So this, this video, you got any more time? Maybe, maybe we can, uh, you got a few more minutes? We can check out some clips from this one, Jay? Can we do it on the next one? I'm getting kind of tired. Let's do it on the next one, yeah, I'm dude. Like getting a little sleepy. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries, man. All right, so we're gonna sign out. Make sure to uh, subscribe to Jay Dyer's YouTube channel. Thank you, Rolf Kraus. Thank you for the last super chat. Set ninety nine cents. Didn't add a comment to the super chat. Just throwing the super chats around. Um, high roller over there. So uh, yeah, uh, just subscribe to jdyer.com, jaysanalysis.com, rather, uh, Jay Dyer on YouTube, and check out primaledgehealth.com. If you guys are interested in private coaching, uh, you can hit us up for that. But uh, if you are interested in private coaching, definitely think about, consider doing the Keto and Carnivore Collective. It's a much better model for doing it. You get more FaceTime, more interaction, and you have a community support aspect to it. That's really cool. So thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, the algorithm has allowed this to uh, make it to the very end, and it even allowed a few hundred viewers. I'm sure nobody got notified. And uh, make sure to like it, subscribe, and share it. Maybe that'll help. Maybe the algorithm will unbury this channel. Uh, but we'll see what happens. So have a good night, everybody. We're out of here.